The first stage of the Apollo 11 Saturn V, designated S-1C-6 for the sixth flight stage, arrived at the Kennedy Space Center on February 20, 1969. Because of their large size, Saturn V stages were shipped to the Kennedy Space Center by ocean-going vessels and specially designed aircraft. The Saturn V was the first large vehicle in the U.S. space program to be conceived and designed for a specific purpose, that of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth. The birth of the Saturn V can be dated to January 10, 1962 when NASA formally announced development of the Big Booster. The 300,000-pound first stage is 33 feet in diameter and 138 feet long. At liftoff, it held nearly 4.5 million pounds of propellant, consisting of E1, a form of kerosene for fuel, and liquid oxygen as oxidizer. The first stage generated a total thrust of around 7.5 million pounds, operating for just two and to lift the vehicle to an altitude of about 38 miles at burnout. The awesome power of the Saturn V first stage was generated by five F-1 engines. Each F-1 engine was a single start, one and a half million pound fixed thrust engine. All of the engines were identical with one exception. The outer four swiveled or gimbaled for steering control. The center engine was fixed. The expense of the Saturn V makes it imperative that no effort be spared to assure that it will perform as expected in flight. The magnitude of the Saturn V ground test program was unprecedented. To qualify for flight, all components and systems had to meet standards deliberately set much higher than actually required. The inspection to which flight hardware was subjected was thorough. X-rays were used to inspect fusion welds. 100 castings and 5,000 transistors and diodes. A quarter mile of welding and five miles of tubing were inspected with the use of ultrasonics. The same type of inspection was given to adhesive bonds, which are equivalent in area to an acre. An electrical current inspection method was used on six miles of tubing, and dye penetrant tests were run on 2.5 miles of welding. Each contractor had its own test program that was patterned to a basic conservative approach. Qualification testing of parts, subassemblies, and assemblies was performed to assure that they are capable of meeting flight requirements. Reliability analysis was conducted to determine the range of failures or margins of error in each component. A battleship test stage constructed more solidly than a flight stage was used to prove major design parameters. The stage verified propellant loading, tank and feed operation, and engine firing techniques. Battleship testing was followed by all systems testing. Finished work undergoes functional checkout to ensure it meets requirements. Fluid carrying components are subjected to pressures beyond normal operating requirements. Rocket engines were static fired before delivery to the stage contractor, and each stage underwent testing leading to a full power captive acceptance firing. After refurbishment and a post firing checkout, it was shipped to Kennedy Space Center. Upon arriving and being offloaded at the dock, the stage would enter a low bay of the VAB or Vehicle Assembly Building. The VAB consists of a high bay area 525 feet tall a low bay area 210 feet tall, and a four-story launch control center connected to the high bay by an enclosed bridge. There are four assembly and checkout bays in the high bay area. The low bay contained eight-stage preparation and checkout cells equipped with systems that simulated stage interfaces. Saturn V stages went into the VAB low bay area where preparation and checkout began. After being towed into the high bay area and positioned under the 250-ton overhead crane, slings were attached to the first stage and attached to the crane. The stage is lifted to a vertical orientation and then positioned over the mobile launcher. 
At this stage in the process, the first stage is still missing the engine nozzle extensions and fairings and fins. These will be added later. The VAB had 141 different lifting devices at the time of the Saturn V, ranging from one-ton mechanical hoists to two 250-ton high bay bridge cranes. Each pair of high bays shares a bridge crane. The cranes have a lifting range of 456 feet and a travel distance of 431 feet. When the stage is positioned over the mobile launcher, it is lowered into place. Then it is secured to four hold down and support arms. These support the entire space vehicle during launch preparation and provide hold down during thrust buildup prior to launch. The second stage for the Apollo 11 Saturn V, S26, arrived at Kennedy Space Center on February 9, 1969. On the Saturn V, the second stage employed cryogenic propellants of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. For the lunar mission, the second stage takes over from the first stage at an altitude of about 38 miles and boosts its payload of the Saturn V third stage and the Apollo spacecraft to approximately 114 miles. When its 5J2 engines ignite, the stage is pushing more than 1 million pounds. Speed of the stage ranges from 6,000 miles per hour to 15,300 miles per hour. The beginning of the second stage boost is a two-step process. When all the F1 engines of the first stage have cut off, the first stage separates. Ollage rocket motors around the base of the second stage then fire for approximately four seconds to give positive acceleration to the stage prior to engine ignition. About 30 seconds after the first stage separation, the part of the second stage structure on which the Ullage rockets are located, the aft interstage, is separated by firing explosive charges. This second separation is a precise maneuver. The 18-foot high interstage must slip past the engines without touching them. With the stages traveling at great speed, the interstage must clear the engines by only a little more than three feet. The second stage burns for about six minutes, pushing its payload into space. The 81-foot second stage is basically a container for its 942,000 pounds of propellant, with engines attached at the bottom. Propellants represent more than 90% of the stage's flight weight. The stage is constructed mostly of lightweight aluminum alloys ribbed in such a fashion that it is rigid enough to endure the pressures to which it is subjected. Special lightweight insulation had to be developed to keep its cryogenic propellants from warming. The second stage developed its power through five Rocketdyne J2 engines, a high-performance upper-stage propulsion system. Each engine developed a maximum vacuum thrust of 225,000 pounds. All J2 engines were identical when delivered. They all were designed to be restarted in flight. The restart capability is only used in the third stage. As in the first stage, the outer four engines in the second stage gimbal, while the center engine is fixed. The second stage of the Apollo 11 Saturn V was erected at the top of the first stage on March 4, 1969. Using the 250-ton bridge crane, the stage was lifted into position with the aft interstage attached.
The Apollo 11 Saturn V's third stage was moved into the VAB for checkout on January 21, 1969. The Saturn V third stage was an oxygen-hydrogen stage derived from the S4 stage originally created as part of the Saturn I program. The S4B stage was also used as the second stage for the Saturn IB. The third stage had a maximum thrust on one J2 engine of 225,000 pounds. The stage was used for the final Earth orbital insertion and reignited to place the Apollo spacecraft on a translunar trajectory. The stage burned for about two and three quarters minutes for orbital insertion and about five and a half minutes for translunar injection. We confirm ignition and the thrust is go. Guidance looking good. Velocity 26,000 feet per second. Cut off. We're showing velocity 35,570 feet per second, altitude 177 nautical miles. Apollo 11, this is Houston. We show, show cutoff and uh, we copy the numbers and now in 62. Apollo 11, Houston, do you read? Apollo 11, this is Houston. Uh, do you read over? Roger, Houston. Apollo 11. Uh, we are reading the VI of 35579er. And the EMS was uh, plus 3.3. Over. Roger, plus 3.3 .3 on the EMS. Because the stage was a part of the vehicle for an extended period of time, it contained an auxiliary propulsion module for attitude control. Two APS modules were mounted 180 degrees apart on the aft skirt assembly. Each module contained three 150-pound thrust engines and one 70-pound thrust ullage motor. The Apollo 11 third stage, with its aft interstage, was placed above stage 2 on March 5, 1969. The instrument unit is the Saturn V's nerve center. It contains the electronic and electrical equipment needed for guidance, tracking, and communications of vehicle environmental and performance data. The IU also contains environmental control equipment for temperature control, batteries, and power supplies to furnish operating power for electronic equipment. The stage structure is 260 inches in diameter and 36 inches high and becomes a load-bearing part of the vehicle. It supports the components within the IU and the weight of the spacecraft. Several tracking systems are used to follow vehicle trajectory during ascent and orbit. Vehicle antennas and transponders, which increase ground-based tracking systems range and accuracy, make up the IU's tracking equipment. The Saturn V is equipped with lots of equipment designed to detect malfunctions. Some of this equipment checks engine thrust, and monitors guidance computer status, attitude rates, angle of attack, and abort request.
This emergency detection information is flashed to the IU where it is routed to the emergency detection distributor in the electrical system. In the case of an emergency, the system will turn on a light in front of the astronauts. If the spacecraft abort selector switch is in the automatic abort position, the abort will take place without further crew participation. The action cannot be vetoed by the astronauts. However, if the selector switch is in the manual position, the crew makes the decision when to abort a mission. The Apollo 11 Lunar Module, LM-5, was designated as Eagle by the crew. The Lunar Module is a two-stage vehicle designed for space operations near and on the Moon. The LM is not capable of re-entering the atmosphere and was the first manned spacecraft designed solely for operation in space. The Lunar Module stands 22 feet 11 inches high and is 31 feet wide diagonally across the landing gear. Joined by four explosive bolts and umbilicals, the ascent and descent stages of the LEM operate as a unit until staging, when the ascent stage functions as a single spacecraft for rendezvous and docking with a CSM. Three main sections make up the ascent stage, the crew compartment, midsection, and the aft equipment bay. Only the crew compartment and midsection are pressurized at 4.8 pounds per square inch. The cabin volume is 235 cubic feet. The descent stage consists of a cruciform load-carrying structure of two pairs of parallel beams, upper and lower decks, and enclosure bulkheads. The center compartment houses the descent engine, and descent propellant tanks are housed in the four square bays around the engine. The descent stage measures 10 feet 7 inches high by 14 feet 1 inch in diameter. In a retracted position until after the crew mans the LEM, the landing gear struts are explosively extended and provide lunar surface landing impact absorption. The main struts are filled with crushable aluminum honeycomb for absorbing compression loads. Foot pads 37 inches in diameter at the end of the landing gear provide support on the surface. Each pad except the forward pad is fitted with a lunar surface sensing probe which signals the crew to shut down the descent engine upon contact with the lunar surface. Eagle had a launch weight of 33,205 pounds. CSM-107, Apollo 11's Command and Service Module spacecraft, was designated as Columbia by the crew. It consisted of a service module 12 feet 10 inches in diameter and 24 feet 7 inches high. For the Apollo 11 mission, it weighed 51,243 pounds at launch. Aluminum honeycomb panels one inch thick form the outer skin and milled aluminum radial beams separate the interior into six sections around a central cylinder containing two helium spheres, four sections containing service propulsion system fuel and oxidizer tankage, another containing fuel cells, cryogenic oxygen and hydrogen, and one section essentially empty. The service propulsion system provided thrust for large spacecraft velocity changes through a gimbal-mounted 20,500-pound thrust hypergolic engine using a nitrogen tetroxide oxidizer and a 50-50 mixture of unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine and hydrazine fuel. The command module is a pressure vessel encased in heat shields cone-shaped 11 feet 5 inches high with a base diameter of 12 feet 10 inches and a launch weight of 12,250 pounds. The command module consists of the forward compartment, which contains two reaction control engines and components of the Earth landing system, the crew compartment or inner pressure vessel containing crew accommodations, 
controls and displays, and many of the spacecraft systems, and the aft compartment housing 10 reaction control engines, propellant tankage, helium tanks, water tanks, and the CSM umbilical connection. The crew compartment contained 210 cubic feet of habitable volume. The command module earth landing system includes the drogue and main parachute system, as well as post-landing recovery aids. In a normal entry descent, the command module forward heat shield is jettisoned at 24,000 feet, permitting mortar deployment of two reefed 16.5-foot diameter drogue parachutes for orienting and decelerating the spacecraft. After drogue release, three mortar-deployed pilot chutes pull out the three main 83-foot diameter parachutes with two-stage reefing to provide gradual inflation in three steps. Two main parachutes out of three can provide a safe landing. Apollo 11, Houston, you're a go for TE hour. Apollo 11, thank you. This is Apollo Control at 134 hours, 48 minutes. Uh, it continues uh, very quiet uh, here in Mission Control. Uh, the flight controllers have been observing the crew inputs to their computer, uh, monitoring as the uh, crew prepares for the trans-Earth injection burn, uh, scheduled to occur at uh, about 35 minutes from now. And this is Apollo Control. We're now less than 30 seconds from the time at which trans-Earth injection is scheduled, the burn to start Apollo 11 on its trajectory back to Earth. Uh, we're now 15 seconds from the scheduled ignition time. Uh, that burn will last about 2 minutes 28 seconds and consume 10,000 pounds of propellant. And the uh, crew should be burning at this time. Of course, that maneuver is performed on the backside of the moon. We have uh, no data from the spacecraft here in mission control at this time. Uh, we won't know how the burn went for about another 10 minutes, which is the time at which we're scheduled to reacquire Apollo 11. AOS. And there's the queue. We have acquisition of signal. Hello, Apollo 11. Houston, how did he go? Over. Don't open up the LRL doors, Charlie. Roger. We got you coming home. It's well stocked. At launch, the lunar module is housed in the spacecraft lunar module adapter section. This is a truncated cone 28 feet long extending from the top of the instrument unit to the bottom of the service module. The entire assembly of CSM, LEM, and spacecraft lunar module adapter are assembled, moved to the VAB, and erected atop the third stage of the launch vehicle. Roger, Dodger. We got uh, Eagle looking good. Uh, it's holding cabin pressure and it picked up about two feet per second from that jettison. I believe that. I can see some uh, cracks uh, in the uh, outer coating uh, around the tunnel. In the thermal protective uh, cover, I don't think it has anything to do with structure. Roger. Hello, Columbia, Houston. We'll have a uh, attitude and a little uh, blip burn for you at about one three zero thirty, so we can uh, separate from Eagle. Over. That's fine. Columbia, Houston. Uh, would you start a maneuver to a uh, about pitch of two three zero for this little uh, tweak burn? Over. Roger, pitch two three zero. Raj, uh, Mike, can verify crack mode uh, in auto for uh, the high gain. The crewmen of Apollo 11 spent more than five hours of formal crew training for each hour of the mission's eight-day duration. This training included detailed briefings on spacecraft systems, operation and modifications, 
Saturn launch vehicle briefings on countdown, range safety, flight dynamics, failure modes, and abort conditions. Briefings were held and continuous training done on mission photographic objectives and use of camera equipment. Stowage reviews and practice in training sessions in the spacecraft mock-ups and command module simulators allowed the crewmen to evaluate spacecraft stowage of crew-associated equipment. More than 400 hours of training per man in command module and lunar module simulators were conducted, along with entry corridor deceleration profiles at lunar return conditions in the centrifuge. Lunar surface briefings and 1G walkthroughs of lunar surface EVA operations were conducted. In addition, the crew became familiar with the flight hardware through visits to the manufacturing facilities and through altitude chamber runs with both spacecraft. In these runs, the spacecraft were placed in a condition simulating flight pressure.
The mobile launcher is a transportable launch base and umbilical tower for the space vehicle. Three mobile launchers were used at Launch Complex 39. The launcher base is a two-story steel structure, 25 feet high, 160 feet long, and 135 feet wide. It is positioned on six steel pedestals 22 feet high, both in the VAB and at the launch pad. At the launch pad, the launcher was also stiffened by four extendable columns designed to counter rebound loads if the Saturn engines cut off. The umbilical tower, extending 398 feet above the launch platform, is mounted on one end of the launcher base. A hammerhead crane at the top has a hook height of 376 feet above the deck. The 12 million pound mobile launcher stands 445 feet high when resting on its pedestals. The launch vehicle sits over a 45 foot square opening which allows an outlet for engine exhaust into the launch pad trench containing a flame deflector. This opening is lined with a replaceable steel blast shield independent of the structure and is cooled by a water curtain initiated two seconds after liftoff. There are nine hydraulically operated service arms on the umbilical tower. These service arms support lines for the vehicle umbilical systems and provide access for personnel to the stages as well as the astronauts to the spacecraft. On Apollo 11, one of the service arms is retracted early in the count. The Apollo spacecraft access arm is partially retracted at T-43 minutes. A third service arm is released at T-30 seconds and a fourth at about T-16 seconds. The remaining five arms are set to swing back at vehicle first motion. The Apollo access arm, service arm 9, located at the 320-foot level above the launcher base, provides access to the spacecraft cabin for the closeout team and astronaut crews. The flight crew boards the spacecraft starting at about T-2 hours 40 minutes. The Apollo 11 vehicle is secured to the mobile launcher by four combination support and hold-down arms mounted on the launcher deck. The hold-down arms are cast in one piece, about 6 by 9 feet at the base and 10 feet tall weighing more than 20 tons. Damper struts secure the vehicle near the top. After the engines ignite, the arms hold Apollo 11 for about six seconds until the engines build up to 95% thrust. The arms release on receipt of a launch commit signal at the zero mark in the count. The vehicle is prevented from accelerating too rapidly by controlled release devices. The six million pound transporters move mobile launchers into the VAB and mobile launchers with assembled Apollo space vehicles to the launch pad. They are also used to transport the mobile service structure to and from the launch pad. Two crawler transporters were constructed and are still used today to transport space shuttle vehicles. Maximum speed of the transporter is about one mile per hour loaded. The three and a half mile trip to Pad A with Apollo 11 took about six hours. The transporter has a leveling system designed to keep the top of the space vehicle vertical within plus or minus 10 minutes of arc, about the dimensions of a basketball. The system also provides leveling operations required to negotiate the 5% ramp which leads to the launch pad and keeps the load level when it is raised and lowered on pedestals. The transporter moves on a roadway almost as broad as an eight-laned highway and is designed to accommodate a combined weight of about 18 million pounds. The roadway was built in three layers with an average depth of seven feet. The base layer is two and a half feet of hydraulic fill. The next layer consists of three feet of crushed rock. The top is covered with a cover of river rock, eight inches deep.
This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control. We're at T-minus two hours, 55 seconds and counting. We're approaching the two-hour mark in our countdown, and we appear to be proceeding satisfactorily at this time. The crew aboard the spacecraft, the 320-foot level, the hatch is closed, and we're beginning to purge the ca cabin to bring it to the uh, proper atmosphere full launch, which is a combination of oxygen and nitrogen, 60% oxygen and 40% nitrogen atmosphere. Of course, the astronauts themselves are breathing pure oxygen through their spacesuits. Coming up shortly will be another key test in which both the uh, launch crew for the, the launch vehicle crew and the spacecraft team uh, combine together with uh, the commander, Neil Armstrong, to make a thorough check of the emergency detection system. This is the system that will signal the astronauts in the cabin if anything goes wrong below them. We use the ground-based computer to accomplish this test. It's rather lengthy as these tests go uh, using a computer. It will take some 30 minutes. Neil Armstrong will be no doing most of the work in the spacecraft, responding as different cue lights uh, signifying different uh, difficulties are presented to him. The abort uh, panel, of course, is across from the commander on the left-hand side, the left front of the spacecraft. Our countdown continuing, T-minus one hour, 59 minutes, 34 seconds and counting. This is Kennedy Launch Control. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control, T-minus one hour, 50 minutes, 55 seconds and counting. We're proceeding with the countdown for the Apollo 11 mission at this time, and it's going satisfactorily. At this point, the spacecraft commander, Neil Armstrong, in the process of uh, working the emergency detection system test. This is uh, working with the launch crew here in the firing room and also the spacecraft team in the uh, control rooms back at the Manned Spacecraft Operations Building here at the Kennedy Space Center. All going well with the... We're flowing hydrogen back into the third stage of the Saturn V launch vehicle after having difficulty with that leaking valve. It appears that we are bypassing the use of the valve directly in loading the hydrogen aboard, but we are getting the hydrogen back in to replenish the supply. All appears to be going well at this time. Weather is go. We're coming up on one hour and 50 minutes. This is Kennedy Launch Control. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control, T-minus one hour, 40 minutes, 55 seconds and counting. The countdown is still proceeding very satisfactory at this time as we lead up toward our planned liftoff time of 9.32 a.m. Eastern Daylight. The spacecraft commander, Neil Armstrong, continuing this extensive series of checks with, of the emergency detection system, working with both the launch vehicle test crew and the spacecraft crew. This is a key test and a very thorough test to assure ourselves before we commit to liftoff that all the emergency detection uh, techniques inside the launch uh, are operating properly here on the ground. So if required in flight, the spacecraft commander and, of course, the two fellow astronauts could be signaled of a difficulty inside the rocket and could take proper abort action as required. Thus far, the three astronauts aboard the spacecraft have just been giving business-like responses back to the uh, directions and checks, working with the spacecraft conductor, Skip Chauvin, as he runs down his procedures as the countdown continues. For T-minus one hour, 39 minutes, 46 seconds and counting, this is launch control. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control, T-minus one hour, 30 minutes, 55 seconds and counting. All elements are at this time, the countdown landing two astronauts on the moon. At this time, the spacecraft test conductor some checks with astronaut Mike Collins aboard the spacecraft. We're winding up this important emergency detection system test 
that Neil Armstrong has been participating in. Meanwhile, at the 320-foot level, the closeout crew now placing the boost protective cover uh, over the hatch now that we have completed the cabin purge and have the proper environment inside the cabin. We have also performed leak checks to assure ourselves uh, that the cabin atmosphere is valid. Protective cover is used during the early phases of the powered flight and is jettisoned with the escape tower shortly after second stage ignition. Here in the firing room, the launch vehicle test team is still keeping a close eye on the status of the propellants aboard the Saturn V launch vehicle. We're back to 100% supply with the liquid hydrogen fuel in the third stage. This problem with the leaking valve is uh, no problem at this time. We've actually bypassed the valve, but we uh, are maintaining our hydrogen supply aboard the vehicle. Uh, all aspects go. The weather is very satisfactory for launch this morning. A thin cloud cover about 15,000 feet. Temperature at launch time expected to be about 85 degrees. T minus one hour seconds and counting. This is Kennedy Launch Control. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control, T minus one hour, 20 minutes, 55 seconds and counting. All of the countdown for Apollo 11 at this time. At this point in the countdown, spacecraft commander Neil Armstrong uh, once again appears to be the busiest worker in the spacecraft as he's performing a series of alignment checks associated with the guidance system in the spacecraft. He's working these checks with the spacecraft test conductor as the spacecraft test conductor reads off the various procedures and Armstrong responds to them. The astronauts aboard the spacecraft by the spacecraft conductor a short while ago that the launch vehicle is go at this time. The Hydrogen problem uh, that we did encounter earlier has been solved. That's real good news, said Armstrong, and then he went back to work shortly thereafter. We're now coming up on the one hour, 20 minute mark in the countdown. Launch control. Mr. Apollo, Saturn launch control, T minus one hour, 11 minutes, 55 seconds and counting. The countdown for Apollo 11 still going very satisfactorily at this time. In most cases, we're a matter of uh, five or ten minutes ahead of the countdown procedures. The crew in the white room at the 320 this time are just in the process of finishing up their work. They've been advised by the spacecraft test conductor that they'll probably be able to move out in about three minutes or so. Once this is accomplished, once the closeout crew does the part, we'll be ready to uh, move that swing arm back, swing arm nine. It will be moved 12 degrees away is about five feet away from the hatch. Once this is accomplished, we will arm the pyrotechnic systems in the spacecraft so the in, in the event of a possible, possible catastrophic condition below them with the launch vehicle, while still on the pad, the astronauts could fire that escape rocket and separate uh, from uh, the rocket in difficulty. The crew, uh, closeout crew about to depart at this time. That swing arm remains about 12 degrees away from the spacecraft hatch, as mentioned, five feet or so, until a five-minute mark in the count when it's fully retracted to its fallback position. The obvious reason here is in the event we do have to get the astronauts out in a hurry, the swing arm is in a standby position and can be moved rapidly back to the hatch, uh, to the hatch level, so the astronauts could depart uh, in the event of an, uh, an emergency. We're coming up on T minus one hour, 10 minutes and 20 seconds. This is Kennedy launch. This is Apollo launch control at one hour, seven minutes, 25 seconds and counting. Countdown still proceeding satisfactorily. For those uh, People who would like to synchronize their watches in relation to the count, 
will synchronize on 26 minutes past the hour, which is now about five seconds away. We'll count down the last five seconds to 26 minutes past the hour. We're now one away from 20 past the hour. In the meantime, we do have uh, information from the civil defense uh, agencies in the area. The estimate is more than a million persons are in the immediate area in Brevard County uh, to watch the launch. Now 40 seconds away from 26 minutes past the hour. Civil Defense Agency reports further that uh, there is extensive heavy traffic, a number of traffic jams, particularly in the area of Titusville, uh, near US-1 and Route 50. Countdown still progressing satisfactorily, 15 seconds away from 26 minutes. Five, four, three, two, Mark, 8.26 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. We're now an hour, five minutes, 55 seconds and counting as uh, it was announced at that point. This is Kennedy Launch Control. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control, T-minus 61 minutes and counting. T-minus 61 minutes on the Apollo 11 countdown, and all elements are go at this time. Astronaut Neil Armstrong has just completed a series of checks on that big service propulsion system engine that sits below him in the stack. We want to assure ourselves before liftoff that that engine can respond to commands from inside the spacecraft. As Neil Armstrong moved his rotational hand controller, we assured ourselves that the engine did respond by swiveling or gimbling. This, of course, is uh, important for maneuvers uh, in space. The countdown is still proceeding very satisfactorily, other than two minor problems. Uh, since we picked up the count at 11 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time last night, all has gone well. As we approach the one-hour mark now in the count, a series of radio frequency and telemetry checks will be in progress uh, with the launch vehicle. We'll also check out the tracking beacons in the uh, instrument unit uh, that travels uh, as a guidance system for the Saturn V during the power phase of flight. Now 59 minutes, 48 seconds and counting. This is Kennedy Launch Control. Saturn Launch Control, T-minus 2 hours, 40 minutes, 40 seconds and counting. At this time, the time crew for Apollo 11 has boarded the high-speed elevator from inside the A level in the mobile launcher, which is the second level inside the launcher. This is a high-speed elevator, 600 feet per minute, which will carry them to the 320-foot level, uh, the spacecraft level. Uh, shortly, uh, we'll expect astronauts Neil Armstrong and Michael Collins to come across swing arm 9, the Apollo access arm, and proceed to the white room and uh, Stand by to board the spacecraft. The third member of the crew, astronaut Edwin Aldrin, will be the one to board the spacecraft, will stand by in the elevator, seated in a chair, while his two comrades first board the spacecraft. Once uh, who sits in the left-hand seat and Collins, who will sit in the right-hand seat uh, during the off, are aboard, then Aldrin will be called and he will uh, take his seat, the middle seat in the spacecraft. The spacecraft commander, Neil Armstrong, and the command module pilot, Michael Collins, now proceeding across the swing arm into the small white room that attaches at the spacecraft level. In the meantime, about 100 feet below, we have a technician, a team of technicians working on a leaking valve, which is a part of the ground support equipment, a part of the system that's used to replenish the fuel supply for the third stage of the Saturn V rocket. 
he is uh, proceeding to tighten a series of bolts around this valve in the hope that this will correct once the technicians do depart the uh, uh, hydrogen will again be flowed through the system to assure that the leak has been corrected. The uh, Neil Armstrong and CMP, the command module pilot Mike Collins, now standing by in the White Room. T minus two hours, 38 minutes, 45 seconds and counting. This is launch control. Apollo set on launch control, T minus two hours, 34 seconds and counting. The spacecraft commander, Neil Armstrong, now aboard the Apollo 11 spacecraft at the 320 foot level at the pad. We added logs uh, having the commander go over the sill into the cabin at 6.54 a.m. Eastern Daylight. Since that time, uh, the commander has now been uh, tied into the system and has checked in over the communication lines. He was wished a good morning by the spacecraft test conductor Skip Chauvin, and Armstrong in return said it looks like morning. In the meantime, 120 feet below him, the technicians continuing to work to tighten bolts around of leaking valves uh, associated with the system that replenishes hydrogen fuel for the third stage. To repeat once again, this is not a problem on the launch vehicle itself, but on the ground support equipment associated with it. T-minus two hours, 33 minutes, 45 seconds and counting. This is Kennedy launch. This is Apollo Saturn launch control. T-minus two hours, 30 minutes, 55 seconds and counting. Right on the hour, the uh, command module pilot, astronaut Michael Collins, who will be sitting on the right-hand side of the spacecraft during liftoff, uh, boarded the spacecraft. We had it logged at 7 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. The third member of the crew, astronaut Buzz Aldrin, standing by in the elevator uh, around the corner along the swing arm uh, from the White Room and the spacecraft at the 320-foot level. 120 feet below, technician still working on some bolts that surround a leaking valve system that replenishes for the third stage of the Saturn V rocket. Our countdown proceeding at this time, coming up toward the two minute and 30 minute, 30 second, the two hour and 30 minute mark in the count. This is Kennedy Launch Control. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control, T minus two hours, 23 minutes, 46 seconds and counting. The third member of the Apollo 11 Prime crew now aboard the spacecraft. We had it logged at 7.07 .07 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time when astronaut Buzz Aldrin boarded the spacecraft. He will sit in the middle seat uh, being liftoff. As lunar module pilot, his normal position uh, would be on the right-hand side. However, due to crew preference, uh, we have uh, the commander, of course, Neil Armstrong, sitting on the left-hand side, the lunar module pilot for the overall flight, Buzz Aldrin, sitting in the middle seat, and the command module pilot, Mike Collins, uh, sitting on the right-hand seat at liftoff. Down below at the 200-foot level, our technicians still hard at work to surround uh, a valve associated with the system that replenishes the hydrogen fuel for the third stage of the Saturn V launch vehicle. This is ground support equipment located on the tower at the pad at the 200-foot level. He continues to work at the 200-foot level as the crew in the white room uh, does the same with the three astronauts aboard. We actually have a fourth astronaut still aboard the spacecraft at this time, astronaut Fred Hayes, who is the backup command module pilot. He is in the lower equipment bay of the spacecraft, giving a helping hand to the three prime crewmen as they uh, start to perform some of the preliminary checks here as we uh, head down over the final uh, two hours, uh, two and a half hours of the countdown. We're at T-minus two hours, 22 minutes, 11 seconds and counting. This is Kennedy Launch Control. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control. We've just passed the two hour, 21 minute mark in our countdown and we are proceeding at this time. At the 320 foot level, astronauts now aboard the spacecraft. Just a few minutes ago, astronaut Buzz Aldrin came in and took the center seat to join 
uh, Neil Armstrong on the left and Mike Collins on the right. These are the positions they will fly at liftoff. Uh, during the process of getting the astronauts checked into the spacecraft, communication cables must be attached to this. They also have to hook into the suit circuit system of the spacecraft that brings oxygen into their suits. They are helped by a fourth astronaut on board, the backup command module pilot, astronaut Fred Hayes, is in the lower equipment bay, and one of the suit technicians who's located behind them to give a hand as they check in. We've heard from Neil Armstrong, and now we've also heard from Mike Collins on comm checks, and we're standing by for further reports as the checkout continues. 120 feet down, the work continues on a leaky valve level. Uh, this is ground support equipment. The technicians still hard at work tightening bolts around that valve at this time. Two hours, 19 minutes, 45 seconds and counting. This is Kennedy Launch Control. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control. T-minus two hours, 10 minutes, 35 seconds and counting. At the 320-foot level, the fourth astronaut aboard the spacecraft regretfully leaves at this time. Astronaut Fred Hay about to come out after giving the three prime crewmen a hand in their preliminary checkouts to board. For Hayes will be coming out shortly. In the meantime, 120 feet below where we had that problem with a leaky valve, the technicians have completed their work, and they are in the process now of departing from the launch pad. In a short while, we'll start flowing hydrogen again back uh, through the general replenishing system to, to uh, continue to top off the supply of the hydrogen fuel in the third stage of the Saturn V launch vehicle. The spacecraft commander, Neil Armstrong, has completed a series of checks uh, called the Board Advisory System Checks. This is where certain key crewmen on the ground, members of the launch team, can signals to the spacecraft commander in the spacecraft with indicate a difficulty during the flight in which he could take abort action if he uh, this determined that such action was necessary. These checks have been completed and Neil Armstrong confirmed that the lights came on in the console in front of him, the panel in front of him, on the ground here in the launch control center. All still going well with our count. Uh, we will stand by as we again uh, bring hydrogen back to the third stage. You will see how that operates. We're now at T-minus two hours, nine minutes, four seconds and counting. And this is Kennedy Launch Control. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control. T-minus two hours, seven minutes and counting. At this time, we're just in the process of closing the hatch on the Apollo 11 spacecraft. Uh, several of the closeout crew shook hands with the astronauts and Craft test conductor Skip Chauvin. We had it logged as the uh, hatch being closed and tightened, uh, still being tightened right at this time, which is 25 minutes past the hour. Once the hatch is closed, uh, we will start a cabin purge to condition uh, the cabin inside. The three astronauts, of course, are on pure oxygen in their spacesuits on the suit circuit. We will uh, produce a cabin atmosphere in the spacecraft of a 60 40 combination. 60% oxygen and 40% nitrogen. This is the atmosphere used for liftoff. Once that is accomplished, the closeout crew will be ready to put the protective cover uh, on the hatch and continue with their closeout. The hatch being closed at this time, we are waiting. We'll stand by to see uh, uh, how our hydrogen condition is as far as replenishing the hydrogen fuel supply with the third stage of the Saturn V. Two hours, five minutes, 50 seconds and counting. This is Kennedy Launch Control. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control. We've just passed the 56 minute mark in our countdown. We're still proceeding in an excellent manner at this time. All elements reporting in that all systems continuing to look good at this point. We're still aiming toward our planned liftoff at the start of the lunar window, 9.32 a.m. Eastern Daylight. A short while ago, in fact, uh, the space conductor the spacecraft test conductor Skip Chauvin informed spacecraft commander Neil Armstrong that we were doing quite well, in fact, some 15 minutes ahead on some aspects of the preparation spacecraft-wise. Armstrong replied that was fine, just as long as we don't launch 15 minutes early, obviously referring to the start of the window. The countdown is still going well, T-minus 55 minutes, 10 seconds and counting. This is Kennedy Launch Control. 
This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control. We passed the 51 minute mark in our countdown. We're now T minus 50 minutes, 51 seconds, and counting. Apollo 11 countdown is still go at this time. All elements reporting ready at this point in the countdown. The spacecraft uh, correction the test supervisor, Bill Schick, has advised all hands here in the control center and uh, spacecraft checkout people. Then in about 30 seconds, that big swing arm that has been attached to the spacecraft up to now will be moved back to a park position some five feet away from the spacecraft. We alert the astronauts because there is a little jolt when the swing arm is moved away. It will remain in that position some five feet away from the spacecraft until the five-minute mark and the count when it's completely pulled back to its retracted position. It's coming up now in five seconds. The swing arm will come back. Mark, the swing arm now coming back from the spacecraft. Countdown proceeding satisfactorily. We've completed our telemetry checks with the launch vehicle. And at this point, with the swing arm back, we arm the pyrotechnics so that escape tower atop the astronauts, atop their spacecraft, could be used if a ca catastrophic condition was going to occur under them with the launch vehicle from this point on down in the countdown. We have the high-speed elevator located at the 320-foot level in the event the astronauts have to get out in a hurry. This is a pre special precaution. Uh, one of the members of the support team for Apollo 11, astronaut Bill Pogue, is here in the firing room. He acts as the capsule communicator during the countdown. His call sign is Stoney. He controls that elevator. He now has it locked at the 320-foot level. These are special precautions for safety purposes during the final phase of the count. Now coming up on the 49-minute mark in the countdown, this is Kennedy Launch Control. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control. We passed the 46-minute mark in our countdown. T minus 45 minutes, 52 seconds, and counting. All elements still go in the countdown at this time. The hard worker in the spacecraft at this point in the countdown, astronaut Buzz Aldrin in the middle seat. He's been uh, working with the spacecraft test conductor on setting up proper switch settings in preparation for pressurizing their reaction control system. These are these uh, big thrusters on the side of the service module. There's actually 16 of them in four quadrants around the service module. They are used for maneuvers in space. We pressurize that system before liftoff. Uh, that uh, particular operation will be coming up in some five minutes or so. In preparation for it, Buzz Aldrin, who has most of the switches uh, in front of him, has been preparing for that particular event. The launch vehicle people keeping an eye on the status of the various propellants aboard the Saturn V launch vehicle. Just at liftoff, uh, we will have a vehicle weighing close to six and a half million pounds on the launch pad. There's more than a million gallons of uh, propellants aboard the three stages of the Saturn V. The reports here in the control center are the propellants are stable. We did take a look a little while ago at the RP-1, the high-grade high kerosene fuel that's used in the first stage of the Saturn V to make sure it was at its proper level. We keep an eye on count and use the aid of computers uh, to keep an overall look on general status. We're now at T-minus 44 minutes, 21 seconds and counting. This is Kennedy Launch Control. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control. We passed the 41-minute mark in our count. T-minus 40 minutes, 53 seconds, and counting. We are continuing, and we are continuing very excellently at this time. There are no problems that have been reported in as the countdown uh, continues to click down. We're still aiming for the start of our window on this, the first flight to land men on the moon. Our, we're aiming toward our planned liftoff time of 9.32 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Coming up shortly will be a key test here in the firing room as far as the launch vehicle people are concerned. It's a, some final checks of the destruct system aboard the three stages of the Saturn V launch vehicle. In the event uh, during powered flight that the vehicle strayed rather violently off course, uh, the range safety officer could take action to destroy the vehicle. This obviously would occur after the astronauts were separated by their escape tower from the faulty vehicle. We make a check of the destruct system to assure that if a signal is required to get through, that in fact it will. This is what is coming up here in the control center at this time. 
All aspects of the mission still go. We're at T-minus 39 minutes, 47 seconds and counting. This is Kennedy Launch Control. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control. We passed the 36-minute mark in our countdown. T-minus 35 minutes, 48 seconds, and counting. We've completed those range safety command checks, all still going well with the countdown. A short while ago, spacecraft test conductor Skip Chauvin asked uh, Neil Armstrong if the crew was comfortable up there. And uh, Neil reported back. He said, it's, we're very comfortable. It's very nice this morning. For a status report, we'll now switch to Mission Control, Houston. This is Apollo Mission Control. Flight Director Cliff Charlesworth's team is on station here in the Mission Operations Control Room, ready to assume the control of this flight at tower clearance. There is a possibility that Apollo 11 check out the command module color TV camera during the first Earth revolution while in contact with the Goldstone Station. If this checkout does occur, we, we acquire Goldstone at 1 hour 29 minutes elapsed time. We have loss of signal at 1 hour 33 minutes 50 seconds elapsed time. This TV camera checkout is a possibility. This is Mission Control Houston.
This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control. We've just passed the 31-minute mark in our count. The T-minus 30 minutes, 52 seconds and counting, aiming toward our planned liftoff time of 32 minutes past the hour, the start of our launch window on this the mission to land men on the moon. The countdown is still proceeding very satisfactorily at this time. We just got by an important test with the launch vehicle, checking out the various batteries in the three stages and instrument unit of the Saturn V. We remain on external power through most of the count to preserve those batteries which must be used during the powered flight. We've just taken a look at them by going internal and then switching back to external again. The batteries all look good. The next time we go internal will be at the 52nd mark with those batteries and they will remain, of course, on internal power during the flight. The lunar module, which has been rather inactive during these latter phases of the count, also is going on internal power at this time on the two batteries in the ascent stage and the four batteries of the descent stage. For the next 20 minutes, we'll take a look at some systems in the lunar module, then power down at about the 10-minute mark in the, in the count, power down uh, the telemetry to uh, preserve the uh, power of the LEM. The lunar module in Apollo 11, of course, when it separates from the command module in lunar orbit, will have the call sign Eagle. The command module call sign, once the two vehicles separate, will be Columbia. Both Columbia and Eagle are go at this time at 29 minutes, 24 seconds. This is Kennedy Launch Control. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control. We've just passed the 26-minute mark in the count. T-minus 25 minutes, 53 seconds and counting. Still proceeding very satisfactorily. At this time, uh, spacecraft test conductor Skip Chauvin will tonight Buzz Aldrin in the middle seat, uh, covering the final pressurization of the reaction control system for the spacecraft. These are those uh, big thrusters on the side of the service module that are used for maneuvers in space. Each one of these thrusters is capable of 100 pounds of thrust. There are 16 of them loaded, located in four quadrants around the service module. We pressurize the system with helium uh, prior to launch to make sure that all will be in readiness for use in space. The countdown is still proceeding satisfactorily. It picked up uh, at the T-minus 9 hour mark at 11 p.m. Eastern Daylight last evening. We two comparatively minor problems uh, since that time. major portion of uh, the countdown uh, during the early morning five arc was taken to load the various propellants aboard the stages of the Saturn V launch vehicle. As we came into the count this morning, we did already have the fuel aboard the first stage, but it was necessary to bring the liquid oxygen aboard all three stages and the liquid hydrogen fuel aboard the second and third stages. Uh, close to uh, three-quarters of a million gallons of propellants were loaded during these five hours. Following uh, that, the astronauts, the prime crew, were awakened at 4.15 a.m. Eastern Daylight as planned in their countdown and proceeded to uh, have a physical examination in which they were declared flight ready. 
They sat down for the normal astronaut fare on lunch day as far as breakfast is concerned, orange juice, steak, scrambled eggs, toast, and coffee. The three pilots were joined by two of their colleagues at breakfast, uh, Director of Flight Crew Operations Deke Slayton and the backup command module pilot Bill Anders, who uh, has been named uh, the Executive Secretary of the National Aeronautics and Space Council. The astronauts departed from their crew quarters. Uh, after checking out their suits, they departed from the crew quarters at 6.27 a.m., and some 27 minutes later, eight miles away from the crew quarters at the Kennedy Space Center, atop the launch pad at Complex 39, 6.54 a.m., the commander, astronaut Neil Armstrong, was the first to board the spacecraft. He was uh, followed about five minutes later by Mike Collins, and finally Buzz Aldrin, the man who was sitting in the middle seat during liftoff, was the third astronaut to come aboard. Two minor problems have been encountered during the count. Early in the count, a malfunction light came on here in the control center, indicating that we might have a communication problem at the launch pad. Nothing to do with the spacecraft, but it indicated we possibly might not be able to talk to some uh, key technicians we had at the pad. Uh, the problem turned out to be very minor, a simple adjustment of some equipment beneath the pad uh, remedied the problem. There was no, uh, in fact, no equipment problem involved. The second problem, we did encounter a leaky valve in part of the equipment that's used to replenish the hydrogen fuel supply on the third stage of the Saturn V launch vehicle. A team of technicians were sent out to the launch pad at about the time the astronauts were traveling to the pad. They tightened some bolts and uh, we were able to bypass this valve and uh, proceed with our countdown. The weather is uh, certainly go. It's a beautiful morning for a launch to the moon. We expect a temperature of about 85 degrees in the Kennedy Space Center area. The wind's about 10 miles, 10 knots rather, from the southeast. And uh, the weather conditions and the round the world track, according to reports of Space Flight Meteorology Group, indicate all weather conditions are acceptable for launch. That's our general status. We've just passed the 22-minute mark in the count. 21 minutes, 55 seconds and counting. This is Kennedy Launch Control. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control. We're now less than 16 minutes away from the planned liftoff of the Apollo 11 vehicle. All still going well with the countdown at this time. The astronauts aboard the spacecraft have had a little chance to rest over the last few minutes or so. At least they haven't been uh, busy with procedures with the spacecraft test conductor. In the meantime, we have been uh, performing final checks on the tracking beacons in the instrument unit, which is used as the guidance system during the powered phase of flight. Once we get down to the three minute and 10 second mark in the countdown, we'll go on an automatic sequence. As the launch vehicle is concerned, all aspects from there on down will be automatic right the ground master computer here in the firing room. This will lead up to the 8.9 minute mark in the countdown when the ignition sequence will begin in those five engines of the first stage, the S1C stage of the Saturn V. At the two-second mark, we'll get uh, information and a signal that all engines are running. And at the zero mark in the countdown, once we get the commit signal, the signal that says that the thrust is proper and acceptable, we then will get a commit and liftoff as the hold-down arms release the vehicle. 
We have some 7.6 million pounds of thrust pushing the vehicle upward, a vehicle that weighs uh, close to 6.5 million pounds. One hour, 14 minutes, 30 seconds and counting. This is Kennedy Launch Control. This is Apollo Saturn Launch Control. We've passed the 11-minute mark. Now T-minus 10 minutes, 54 seconds on our countdown for Apollo 11. All still go at this time. The astronauts in the spacecraft busy again. The commander, Neil Armstrong, has uh, performed some stabilization and control system of the spacecraft. The spacecraft also now is on full internal power. This came shortly after the 15-minute mark spacecraft now in the full power of its fuel cells. Up to this time, it had been sharing the load with an external power source. Both Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin have armed their rotational hand controllers, the controllers they use in flight, and we have now gone to the automatic system with the emergency detection system, that system that would uh, cue the astronauts uh, uh, if there's trouble down below with the Saturn V rocket during the powered flight. We're now coming up on the 10 minute mark, 10 minutes away from our plan. Mark, T minus 10 minutes and count. And we're aiming for our plan liftoff at 32 minutes past the hour. This is Kennedy Launch Control.
This is Apollo Saturn launch control. We passed the six minute mark in Apollo 11. Now five minutes, 52 seconds and counting. We're on time at the present time for our planned liftoff of 32 minutes past the hour. Spacecraft test conductor Skip Chauvin now has completed the status check of his personnel in the control room. All report they are go for the mission, and this has been reported to the test supervisor, Bill Schick. The test supervisor are now going through some status checks. Launch operations manager Paul Donner reports go for launch. Launch director Rocco Patron now gives a go with five minutes, 20 seconds and counting. Coming up shortly, that swing arm up at the spacecraft level will come back to its fully retracted position. This should occur at the five minute mark in the count. In the meantime, the lunar module tele telemetry has been powered down. We took a good look at Eagle and it looks good. The spacecraft lunar module reported that Eagle was go. The swing arm now coming back to its fully retracted position as our countdown continues. T minus four minutes, 50 seconds and counting. Skip Chauvin informing the astronauts that the swing arm now coming back. The astronauts will have a few more reports coming up in the countdown. The last business report will be from Neil Armstrong at the 45 second mark in the count when he gives a status on the final alignment of the stabilization and control system. We're now passing the 4 minute 30 second mark in the countdown. Still go at this time. Four minutes, 15 seconds, the test supervisor now is informed launch vehicle test conductor Norm Carlson, you are go, go for launch. From this time down, uh, Carlson uh, handles the countdown as the launch vehicle uh, begins to build up. We're now hitting the four minute mark. Four, minute mar four minutes, in, we are go for Apollo 11. We'll go on an automatic sequence uh, starting at three minutes and seven seconds. Three minutes, 45 seconds and counting. And the final uh, abort checks between uh, several key members of the crew here in the control center and the astronauts. We wish the crew on the launch team's behalf good luck and Godspeed. Three minutes, 25 seconds and counting. We're still go at this time. We'll be coming up on the automatic sequence about uh, 10 or 15 seconds from this time. All still go at this time. Neil Armstrong reported back when he received the good wishes. Thank you very much. We know it will be a good flight. Firing command coming in now. We are on the automatic sequence. We're approaching the three minute mark in the count. T minus three minutes and counting. T minus three. We are go with all elements of the mission at this time. We're on an automatic sequence as the master computer supervises hundreds of events occurring over these last few minutes. T minus two minutes, 45 seconds and counting. The members of the launch team here in the control center monitoring a number of what we call red line values. These are tolerances we don't want to go above and below in temperatures and pressures. They're standing by to call out any deviations from our plans. Two minutes, 30 seconds and counting. We're still go on Apollo 11 at this time. The vehicle starting to pressurize as far as the propellant tanks are concerned and all is still as we Monitor our status void. Two minutes, ten seconds and counting. The target for the Apollo 11 astronauts, the moon at liftoff, will be at a distance of 218,096 miles away. We've just passed the two minute mark in the countdown. T minus one minute, 54 second counting. Our status board indicates that the Oxidizer tanks in the second and third stages now have pressurized. We continue to build up pressure in all three stages uh, here at the last minute uh, to prepare it for a liftoff. T minus one minute, 35 seconds on the Apollo mission, the flight to land of the first men on the moon. All indications uh, coming in uh, to the control center at this time indicate we are go. One minute, 25 seconds and counting. Our steward indicates case the third stage completely pressurized. 80 second mark has now been passed. We'll go on full internal power at the 50 second mark in the countdown. Guidance system goes on internal at 17 seconds, leading up to the ignition sequence at 8.9 seconds. We're approaching the 60 second mark on the Apollo 11 mission. 
T minus 60 seconds and counting. We pass T minus 60. 55 seconds and counting. Neil Armstrong just reported back. It's been a real smooth countdown. We pass the 50 second mark. Power transfer is complete. We're on internal power with the launch vehicle at this time. 40 seconds away from the Apollo 11 liftoff. All the second stage tanks now pressurized. 35 seconds and counting. We are still go with Apollo 11. 30 seconds and counting. Astronauts report it feels good. T minus 25 seconds. 20 seconds and counting. T minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence starts. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff of Apollo 11. Tower cleared. Here we got a roll program. Neil Armstrong reporting the roll and pitch program, which puts Apollo 11 on proper heading. Plus 30 seconds. Roll is complete and the pitch is programming. One Bravo. One Bravo is a abort control mode. Altitude's two miles. Houston, you're good at one minute. Downrange one mile, altitude three, four miles now. Velocity 2,195 feet per second. Uh, start model pressure red line is lit. I don't... Where? Yeah, it don't make a difference. No difference. Okay, let's punch them out. Everything is go, Ralph. We're through the region of maximum dynamic pressure now. Yeah, everything looks good here. We're at 13 miles. Set 8 miles downrange, 12 miles high. Velocity, 4,000 feet per second. Stand by for mode 1, Charlie. Mark, mode 1, Charlie. 1, Charlie. Cliff Charlesworth taking a staging status. This is Houston, you are go for staging. Inboard cutoff. Inboard engines out. Come inboard cutoff. Downrange 35 miles, 30 miles high. Standing by for the outboard engine cut down now.
one Bravo is a abort control mode. All the second stage tanks now pressurized. 35 seconds and counting. We are still go with Apollo 11. 30 seconds and counting. Astronauts report it feels good. T minus 25 seconds. 20 seconds and counting. T minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence starts. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Tower cleared. Here we got a roll program. Neil Armstrong reporting the roll and pitch program, which puts Apollo 11 on a proper heading. Plus 30 seconds. Roll complete and the pitch is programmed. Second stage tanks now pressurized. 35 seconds and counting. We are 30 seconds and counting. Astronauts report it feels good. T minus 25 seconds. 20 seconds and counting. T minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence starts. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past Apollo 11. Tower cleared. Here we got a roll program. Neil Armstrong reporting the roll and pitch program, which puts Apollo 11 on a proper heading. Plus 30 seconds. Roll is complete and the pitch is programmed. Second stage tanks now pressurized. 35 seconds and counting. We are still go with Apollo 11. 30 seconds and counting. Astronauts report it feels good. T minus 25 seconds. 20 seconds and counting. T minus 15 seconds. Guidance is in. 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence starts. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Tower cleared. Here we got a roll program. Neil Arms recording the roll. Roll and pitch program, which puts Apollo 11 on a proper heading. Plus 30 seconds. Roll is complete and the pitch is programmed.
the second stage tanks now pressurized. 35 seconds and counting. We are still go with Apollo 11. 30 seconds and counting. Astronauts report it feels good. T minus 25 seconds. 20 seconds and counting. T minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence starts. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the liftoff on Apollo 11. Tower cleared. Here we got a roll program. Neil Armstrong reporting the roll and pitch program, which puts Apollo 11. Second stage tanks now pressurized. 35 seconds and counting. We are still go with Apollo 11. 30 seconds and counting. Astronauts report it feels good. T minus 25 seconds. 20 seconds and counting. T minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence starts. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Tower cleared. Here we got a roll program. Neil Armstrong reporting the roll and pitch program, which puts Apollo 11 on a proper heading. Plus 30 seconds. Roll is complete and the pitch is programmed. Ignition sequence starts. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Clock start, flight, Roger. We have a liftoff. 32 Trust go, all engines, Roger. Flight flight up, go with the IP. Roger, IP. Neil Armstrong reporting the roll and pitch program, which puts Apollo 11 on proper heading. Flight range safety is nominal. Roger, RSO. Roll is complete and the pitch is programmed. One battle. Flight range safety is in the order. Roger, RSO. Roger, how are you, Booster? We're going to fly. 31 minute cap now. Oh, well, then you see you're good at one minute. Downrange, one mile, altitude, three, four miles now. Velocity, 2,100 miles per second. Right, flight, how are you? Looking good, flight. GNC? Looks good, flight. Ecom? Looking good, flight. Roger. Of maximum Booster flight, how are you? 
We're go flight, Sergeant. We're we're go flight. Everything's good, Sergeant. Set eight miles down range, twelve miles high. Velocity four thousand feet. Stand by for mode one, Charlie. Stand by for mode one, Charlie. Mark. Mark. Staging mode status one, booster. Go. Auto. Go. Go. Guidance. Go. Good for staging, Captain. Captain Charles Worth taking a staging status. This is Houston. You are go for staging. Confirm in port. Roger. Downrange 30 miles. Now? 30 miles. Go flight. Standing by for the outboard engine cut. Or go flight. Roger. Cut off ignition. Roger. Trajectory verified. Roger. Thrust is go all engines. Looks good, Capcom. Eleven Houston, thrust is go all engines. You're looking good. Hi, Roger. You're loud and clear, Houston. Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Clock start flight, Roger. Trust go all engines, Roger. Flight final, go with the IP. Roger, IP. Neil Armstrong reporting the roll and pitch program with the Apollo 11 on proper heading. Flight range safety is nominal. Roger, RSO. Rolls complete and the pitch is programming. One battle. A flight range safety is in the water. Roger, RSO. Roger, how are you, Booster? We're going to fly. Good at one minute, Captain. Oh, well, then you see you're good at one minute. Downrange, one mile, altitude, three, four miles now. Velocity, 2,100 miles right, per second. Looking good, flight. GNC? Looks good, flight. Ecom? Looking good, flight. Roger. Booster flight, are you? We're go flight, Sergeant. We're we're go flight. Everything's good. Roger. Set eight miles down range, twelve miles high. Velocity four thousand. Stand feet. by for mode one, Charlie. Stand by for mode one, Charlie. Mark. Mark. Staging mode status one, booster. Go. Fido. Go. Guidance. Go. Good for staging, Captain. Chris Charles Worth taking a staging status. This is Houston. You are go for staging. Three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Clock start flight, Roger. We have a liftoff. 32. Trust go all engines, Roger. Flight fight up, go with the IP. Roger, IP. Neil Armstrong reporting the rolling picture program with puts Apollo 11 on proper heading. Flight range safety is nominal. Roger, RSO. Rolls complete and the pitch is programming. Flight range safety is in the water. Roger, RSO. Okay, we're leaving. Roger, how you, Booster? We're going to flight. Good in one minute, Captain. Oh, 
Well, you see you're good at one minute. Downrange one mile, altitude three, four miles now. Velocity 2,195 per second. Looking good, flight. GNC? Looks good, flight. Ecom? Looking good, flight. Roger. Booster flight, how are you? We're go flight, Sergeant. We're we're go flight. Everything's good. Roger. Set eight miles down range, twelve miles high. Velocity four thousand. Stand feet. by for mode one, Charlie. Stand by for mode one, Charlie. Mark. Mark. Staging mode status one, booster. Go. Fido. Go. Guidance. Go. Good for staging, Captain. Tip Charles worth taking a staging status. This is Houston. You are go for staging. Two, one, zero. All engine running. Clock start, flight. Roger. We have a liftoff. Thirty-two. Trust go all engines. Roger. Flight Fido, go with the IP. Roger, IP. Neil Armstrong reporting the rolling pitch program, which puts Apollo 11 on proper heading. Flight range safety is nominal. Roger, RSO. Rolls complete and the pitch is programmed. Right, safety valve in the water. Roger, RSO. Okay. Okay. Roger, how are you, Booster? We're going to fly. Good at one minute, Captain. Oh, well, then you see you're good at one minute. Downrange, one mile, altitude three, four miles now. Velocity 2,195 right, per second. Looking good, flight. GNC? Looks good, flight. Ecom? Looking good. Roger. We're through the region of maximum. Booster diamond. flight, how are you? We're going flight, Sergeant. We're, we're going flight. Everything's good. Roger. Set eight miles down range, twelve miles high. Velocity four thousand feet. Stand feet. by for mode one, Charlie. Stand by for mode one, Charlie. Mark. Mark. Staging mode step zero. booster. Go. Fido. Go. Guidance. Go. Good for staging, Captain. Tip Charles worth taking a staging status. This is Houston. You are go for staging. Confirm in port. Roger. Clock start flight. Roger. Trust go all engines. Roger. Flight Fido, go with the IP. Roger, IP. The Armstrong reporting the rolling pitch program, which puts Apollo 11 on proper heading. Flight range safety is nominal. Roger, RSO. Rolls complete and the pitch is programmed. One battle. A flight range safety is in the water. Roger, RSO. Roger, how are you, Booster? We're going to fly. Good at one minute, Captain. Oh, well, then you see you're good at one minute. 
downrange one mile, altitude three, four miles now. Velocity 2,100 flight how you per second. Looking good, flight. GNC? Looks good, flight. Ecom? Looking good, flight. Roger. We're through the region of maximum. Booster flight, how you? We're go flight, surgeon. We're we're go flight. Everything's good. Roger. Set eight miles downrange, twelve miles high. Velocity four thousand feet. Stand by for mode one, Charlie. Stand by for mode one, Charlie. Mark. Mark. Staging mode status one, booster. Go. Fido. Go. Guidance. Go. Good for staging, Captain. Tip Charles, we're taking a staging status. This is Houston. You are go for staging. Inboard engines out. Confirm in port. Roger. Downrange 30 miles. Now? 30 miles. Go flight. Standing by for the outboard engine cut. Or go flight. Roger. Cut off, ignition. Roger. Trajectory verified. Roger. Thrusters go all engines. Looks good, Captain. Houston, thrusters go all engines. You're looking good. Hi, Roger. You're loud and clear, Houston.
we believe that uh, Mike Collins is now maneuvering with the spacecraft uh, and the transposition and docking maneuver and uh, the antenna patterns aren't too good at the moment. So we have a weak signal strength. Broadcasting in the blind. Request Omni Bravo. If you read us, request Omni Bravo. Out. Apollo 11. This is Houston. How do you read? Still showing weak signal strength. Apollo 11, this is Houston. How do you read? Over. Apollo 11, Apollo 11, this is Houston. Do you read? Over. This is Houston, radio check over. Apollo 11, Apollo 11. This is Houston, radio check over. This is Houston, radio check over. All right, Roger, we're copying you about uh, five by two, very weak. Can you give us a status report, please? I uh, understand you are using the high gain, over. you very loud and clear, Buzz. Mike's pretty weak. Roger, we've got the high gain uh, locked on now, I believe, auto track and now. Okay, you're coming in uh, loud and clear, but uh, Mike is just barely readable. Yeah, that was Neil. How are you reading, Mike? Uh, loud and clear now, Mike, and we understand that you are, Doc. That's fine. CDR, loud and clear, Neil. Okay. This is Apollo Control. Apollo 11's velocity now 21,096 feet per second. Distance from Earth 6,649 nautical miles. Houston, over. Oh, Apollo 11, Houston, Goldstone says that the TV looks uh, great, over. Oh. 
Uh, we'd like a little. Stand by. Start over with we were saying. You could turn the earth a little bit so we could get a little bit more uh, than just water. Uh, Roger, Levin. I don't think we got much control over that. Looks like you'll have to settle for the water.
ะ
Houston, over. Houston, uh, Goldstone reports they're receiving uh, a TV picture coming down from you all. Uh, a little snowy, but a uh, good TV picture, over. I'm um, Roger, we're uh, just testing equipment up here. Roger. Ask them if they can read the numbers. Oh, okay, stand by. Uh, What's going on the dead scene also, whether they can see uh, P-R-O-G, D-E-R-V, and N-O-U-N, over. Uh, Roger, stand by a second. Goldstone, M-N-O, Houston, Capcom, over. Capcom, Goldstone, go ahead. Uh, Roger, did you copy the uh, spacecraft request? Uh, that's affirmative. I am reading the numbers on our monitor here. Okay, that's uh, similar. Roger, that's both the... Uh, the numbers on the disk itself and the uh, little words like uh, program, and, uh, verb, noun, computer, activity, things of the sort. Uh, Roger, I can read the numbers uh, clearly. Uh, we can't distinguish what the words are because it is a little snowy. Uh, Roger. Thank you. Okay, I read verb, noun. And program.
Here's the ball up. Go ahead, 11. Oh, Charlie, is that you? Uh, that's me. How are you there? Oh, just fine. How's the old white team today? Uh, the old white team's uh, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed. Uh, we're ever alert down here. Ever alert, Mitchell. Hey, you got any uh, medics down there watching heart rate? I'm uh, trying to do some running in place down here, and I'm wondering, just out of curiosity, whether it breaks my heart rate up. Uh, well, they will spring into action here momentarily. Stand by. Houston, the Goldstone TV people also see 
Kennedy banding when uh, same time y'all do, over. Okay, would they call it a horizontal waviness, uh, instead of banding, maybe? No, uh, I'm not talking to them directly. Stand by, Buzz. Let me see what they, how they describe it. Ghost on MNO, Houston Capcom. Could you put the TV guy on the loop, please? Capcom, Goldstone, Roger. Capcom, Goldstone M&O, Net 1. Go. Uh, the TV people do not have access to Net 1 in that area. I suggest we use Net 2 for that purpose. Okay, going to Net 2. Apollo 11, Houston, uh, the Goldstone TV guys uh, say that uh, they have some uh, horizontal banding uh, across the uh, upper part of the picture and across the uh, lower part. Uh, they would consider the lines just uh, straight, uh, no waviness to them at all, over. Roger, understand. They do seem to distort from vertical line to line, though. Uh, say again about the vertical lines, Buzz. When there's a vertical line, uh, these horizontal uh, bands tend to uh, put small waves in it. Uh, right, I copy. He didn't mention that. Uh, stand by, I'll check again.
Hello, Apollo 11, Houston. Uh, please select uh, Omni Bravo on board. Over. Take on the Bravo, Johnny. Rock. How's everything going down there? You guys happy with spacecraft systems? The Rock, uh, affirmative. Everything's looking uh, really good to us. Over. Okay, same here. How far out can you pick up TV off the Omni? Stand by. Okay, level, we have a picture. We see the Earth right in the center of the screen. Over. Hi, Roger. Houston, Apollo 11. Calling in from about 130,000 miles out. And uh, we'll zoom our camera in slowly uh, to get the most magnification we can. Uh, over. Roger. Eleven Houston, uh, the uh, definition is uh, pretty good on our monitor here. The color is not too uh, varsity, at, at least on this set. Uh, could you describe what you're uh, looking at? Over. Roger, you're seeing Earth as uh, we see it uh, at our left-hand window, just a little more than a half Earth. Uh, we're looking at uh, the eastern. Pacific Ocean, and the north half of the top half of the screen, uh, we can see uh, North America, Alaska, United States, Canada, Mexico, and Central America. South America becomes invisible just off beyond the Terminator or inside the shadow. We can see uh, the oceans with uh, a definite blue cast. See white bands of major cloud formations across the Earth, and can see coastlines. Pick out uh, the western U.S., San Joaquin Valley, the Sierra Mountain Range, the peninsula of Baja California, and can see some cloud formations over uh, southeastern U.S. There's one uh, definite uh, mild storm southwest of Alaska. looks like about uh, 500 to 1,000 miles. And another uh, very minor storm showing uh, the south end of the screen near the, uh, oh, a long way south of the equator, probably, uh, 45 degrees or more south latitude. 
can pick out uh, the ground, the browns uh, in the landforms pretty well. The greens do not show up very well. Uh, some greens join uh, along the uh, northeastern, northwestern coast of the United States and uh, northwestern coast of Canada. Uh, Roger Levin, it's a uh, pretty good picture on clarity here. We're having, uh, can you tell us, uh, it appears to us that there are two distinct uh, uh, cloud formations uh, trending uh, east-west, one approximately about along the equator and one around uh, 30 or so uh, south latitude. Uh, is, could you tell us exactly where those cross the, the uh, land masses are? Oh. Uh, yes, they they cross uh, just uh, south of uh, of uh, the lower part of Mexico, probably through Central America. That is the equatorial band, which we assume to be the intertropical convergence zone. The other band, which is about 30 south, correctly seems to uh, appear to join the uh, equator at the far left or just beyond the horizon on the left edge of Earth, or at least looks like it's going to join it. We don't have an explanation for that banding. Uh, Roger, Neil. Thank you. Uh, it also appears that uh, just to the uh, left of the Terminator, up in the northern hemisphere, there's a, a cloud band trending, uh, a, a gap in the clouds trending uh, northwest, southeast. It appears to us that that comes in uh, about over the northern United States, or perhaps the central United States. Is that about correct? Over. Uh, I can uh, see on the monitor the thing you're talking about, but right now I can't get my eye to the window to pick out uh, just where it crosses the uh, shoreline. Roger. Uh, you guys are doing a good job. It's a real steady picture here. Where uh, 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 clarity is uh, excellent, uh, the color, uh, it's uh, the clouds are the whites are distinct. Uh, the rest of it looks like a to me anyway on the monitor I'm observing is a, uh, a fairly uh, uh, greenish blue is the way I describe it. Over. It appears that the... Well, we can't observe, uh, oh, we can't yeah. appear, observe much green from the spacecraft. Uh, Roger. Uh, on this monitor, the land masses uh, appear to be just a darker uh, grayish color rather than a brown. Well, it's uh, true that uh, we do not have the depth of color at this range uh, that we enjoy it at 50,000 miles out. However, the oceans still are a definite blue, and uh, the the uh, continents are uh, generally uh, brownish in cast, although it it is true that they're uh, tending more toward gray now than they, they were at the closer ranges. Uh, Roger, 11. We've been, uh, I've just been vectored to another monitor, and uh, sure enough, the browns are coming in a lot more distinctly on the uh, Ida 4 that we have up on our uh, screen in the control center. Over. Okay, uh, world, hold on to your hat. I'm going to turn you upside down. Eleven, that's a pretty good roll there. Ah, that's pretty sloppy, Charlie. Let me try that one again. You'll never beat out the Thunderbirds.
Uh, Apollo 11 Houston, that practice did you some good. It's looking a uh, real smooth roll there. That spoke too soon. All right, making myself seasick doing it, Charlie. I'll just put you back right side up where you belong. Roger. You don't get to do that every day. Uh, 11, uh, Houston, uh, could you describe, uh, from your view, uh, the uh, polar cloud cap appears to us to uh, extend uh, down the western coast of uh, North America? Uh, would, you, would you estimate how far it ex uh, extends down over? Everybody into the window. It appears that the cloud cap comes down uh, a little bit below uh, the southern extremity of Alaska. Roger. We've uh, eleven. We've lost our picture here now. Apollo 11, Houston, uh, here's to us that uh, we're seeing a view from outside plus a little of the uh, of the inside. It appears you've taken the camera away from the left window. Now over. That's correct. We're uh, moving it back and uh, reconfiguring for uh, interior lighting. Roger. Uh, we can still see the earth uh, through the left window, and it appears that uh, we can see a floodlight uh, off to the left, either that or some sun shafting through the hatch window. It's floodlight. Ah, uh, now we're coming in. Uh, can't quite make out who that is. That's big Mike Collins there. Well, you got a little bit of... Yeah, hello there, sports fans. You got a little bit of me, plus Neil's in the center couch, and Buzz is doing the camera work this time. Uh, Roger, uh, a little dark uh, now, Levin. Uh, 
maybe a, a bigger F stop might help. Yeah, that didn't work. Uh, it's getting a lot better now, Levin. Uh, Mike, you coming in uh, five by. I got a good. Well, I put on a coat and tie if I'd known about this ahead of time. Is uh, Buzz holding your cue cards for you over? Cue cards have a no. We have, we have no intention of competing with the professionals, believe me. We are very comfortable up here, though. We do have a happy home. Uh, there's plenty of room for the three of us, and uh, I think uh, we're all learning to find our favorite little corner to, uh, to sit in. The zero G is very comfortable, but uh, after a while, you get to the point where you sort of get tired of rattling around and banging off the ceiling and the floor and the side, so you, uh, you tend to find a little corner somewhere and put your knees up or something like that to wet yourself in, and that seems more at home. Uh, Roger, uh, looks like uh, Neil is coming in five by there. Uh, Eleven, uh, Mike, see you in the background. Uh, the, the definition is uh, really outstanding. The uh, colors are good. Uh, it's a real good picture we're getting here. The Commander Armstrong. Uh, we, uh, when you, uh, Buzz, when you take the camera over towards the uh, window where the sun chanting through, it tends to uh, uh, blank it out, though. Yeah, Neil's standing on his head again. He's trying to make me nervous. Uh, Roger. He's disappearing up into the tunnel, of course, uh, as he was going into the litter module only backwards. Uh, Roger, we can see portions of the LAB now, the system test meter panel uh, in the lower part of the picture, or we did have it anyway. Okay, and then directly behind his head are our optical instruments, the section and the telescope that we used to take uh, sightings with. All right, you copy, and we see the disc flashing with a 651. In fact, we can read registers one and two quite clearly. Yeah, the old high gain uh, angle telling us which way the Earth is. Uh, copy. That's a beautiful picture. Clarity is outstanding. Yeah, yeah. We can also give you the time of day in, uh, in our system of mission elapsed time, elapsed time, 34 hours, 16 minutes, and umpteen seconds. Roger. Can you see that uh, clearly enough, Charlie? Uh, Roger, Apollo 11. We can see it counting up every t uh, every second. Uh, we got 34.17.02 uh, now. Okay, back to the high gain angles. Uh, Roger. Swing amp. And yeah, we've amputated those. Eleven uh, Houston, uh, it's uh, we have a beautiful rainbow there, and as you move the camera around, uh, rapidly, uh, that looks like a star chart coming into view now. Over. Yeah, those are both two star charts that he uh, is using right now as sunshades over the uh, right-hand window, window number five. Uh, Roger, we see the sun shining in through it behind him and uh, plotting out the uh, uh, equator. Uh, Correction, the ecliptic plane, and uh, the stars that you're using for the navigation. You're right. He doesn't really need to charge. He's got to memorize it just for show. So we copy. Well, we're uh, pointing up in this direction. We see out our side windows, the sun going by, and of course, out one of our windows right now, we've got the Earth. 
Uh, right behind my window, we have the sun, because the sun is illuminating the uh, star chart that we see. This line represents the ecliptic plane, and uh, these lines, vertical lines, represent our uh, reference system that uh, the spacecraft is using at this time. As we approach the moon, uh, the moon will gradually grow larger and larger in size, and eventually it will be in the uh, eclipse. It will be eclipsing the uh, sun as we go behind it, as we approach the uh, lunar orbit insertion maneuver. Uh, Roger, 11. Uh, we've, uh, could you attempt a little bit better fo focus there, 11, over? Eleven Houston, uh, that's uh, a lot better on the star chart now. We can uh, make out the ecliptic plane and the uh, the planets and the the sun and the moon as it uh, as they're drawn at various places uh, throughout the ecliptic plane. Over. Okay, Charlie. Get some of the wires untangled here. We'll uh, give you a demonstration of how easy push-ups are up here. Seven, Roger. Ah, get the deal buzz there. Figure out whether that was a chin up or a push up. Just take your choice, I guess.
three times for three ounces of hot water and then mush it up and uh, slice the end off it. And there you go, beautiful chicken stew. Sounds delicious. Yeah, the food so far has been very good. Uh, we couldn't be happier with it. Roger. The surgeons are saying thank you there for that. And uh, it is sort of down in a dark corner, so uh, we have a flashlight here to, to help us uh, see things. And uh, if I can let go of it carefully, it'll uh, just hold itself right where it is. Ah, Roger. As long to disturb it, will. Apollo 11, you said it's a pretty good demonstration. You started off really stable there, Mike. It, uh... Well, the problem is, no matter how carefully you let go, uh, you bump it just a tiny little bit and set it in motion, and uh, once in motion, there she goes. Try that again. Uh, it looks uh, fairly stable now with slow rotation. Well, so much for the food department. I'm going to close up the store down here. Roger, we copy. Uh, Charlie, we checked out the cable lines, and uh, we're thinking we might want to uh, see if we can take the TV into the uh, uh, line with us tomorrow for uh, part of the time. Over. Roger, good show. Uh, we'd like to see it if uh, it'll reach that far. Over. We'll give it a try. Houston, Roger. Slowly sinking into the sack there. Yeah, it's really comfortable. Forgot to give Buzzy flashlight back. Apollo 11, Houston, uh, could you give the folks a, uh, a view of your uh, patch if, uh, uh, on your CWGs, over. Eleven, uh, Houston, uh, we have the patch. Uh, could you attempt to prove the focus slightly? Over. Eleven, Houston, a scan on it. the camera uh, makes the. Uh, uh, that's a little bit better now. The uh, flashlight seems to flicker. Uh, Due to the scan on the uh, TV, we can see the eagle. Uh, now nah, that's a, a little bit better. Over. Could you open the f-stop uh, a little bit more? Over. Yeah, we're 
Houston, uh, the color is uh, better now. It's coming in. Uh, we could uh, attempt a little bit better focus on it. Uh, uh, there we go. Our focus is uh, a lot better now. We see the eagle uh, coming right in on the lunar surface. Over. Uh, that's very good now. Apollo 11, Houston, that's very good now. We can see the Earth in the background, Apollo 11, and the Eagle coming in. Probably pretty hard to see the olive branch. Uh, Roger, it is. Well, that's what he has in his talons, is an olive branch. Copy. Apollo 11, Houston, uh, we're really impressed with the clarity and the detail that we have in the picture. The, the colors are, uh, and that's a really an excellent picture now that I'm looking at on our monitor, which is about 12 seconds before the uh, networks uh, can uh, get it out due to the uh, conversion that we have here on our TV converter. The, uh, we're looking at the uh, uh, controls and display, the main display console, and we can see the uh, disky uh, up on the, the panel. Over. of how our crew has the interface with the computer talking to the uh, programs and all that we have in the computer. Well, that's right, Charlie. Sometimes it tells us things and sometimes we tell it things. And mostly it talks to us.
Channel 11, Houston, Houston, we just lost our pick. I see we're going back outside now. Over. Eleven, Houston, you copy over. Hey, do we copy? And uh, as uh, we pan back out to uh, the distance at which we see the Earth, we'll have Apollo Eleven signing on. Roger, Apollo Eleven. Thank you much for the uh, show. It's a real good half hour. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Out. Sing a trim maneuver to X Cal attitude. Houston, Columbia. Go ahead, Columbia, over. Roger, there'll be no television in the undocking. I have all available windows. These are uh, cameras, and I'm busy with other things. We concur. Over. Eagle, Houston, we'd like you to select F Omni now. It'll be good for both the LOS and AOS. Over. All right, you're going to F Omni. Houston, one minute to uh, LOS. Control. We've had loss of signal now. Uh, we'll reacquire the spacecraft again uh, on the 13th revolution in about 45 minutes. At the end of this uh, pass, we passed along the go for undocking. Uh, that maneuver will occur uh, just before we reacquire the spacecraft on the 13th revolution and will be followed in about 30, 30 minutes, uh, about 30 minutes later by a small separator performed by Mike Collins in the command module. Uh, the checkout of the LEM has been going extremely well uh, up to now ahead of schedule. This look very, very good. At 99 hours, 31 minutes, this is Apollo Control, Houston. This is Apollo Control at 100 hours, 14 minutes. We are now less than two minutes from reacquiring the spacecraft on the 13th revolution. When next we hear from them, uh, the lunar module should be undocked from the command and service module. Uh, we're presently about 25 minutes away from the uh, separation burn, which will be performed by Mike Collins in the command module uh, to give the LEM and the CSM a separation distance at the descent orbit insertion maneuver of about two miles. Uh, we have some times on uh, the upcoming events. The uh, separation maneuver is scheduled to occur at a ground elapsed time of 100 hours, 39 minutes, 50 seconds. The descent orbit insertion maneuver, which will be performed on the back side of the moon, uh, set for 101 hours, 36 minutes, 14 seconds. And the begin of the powered descent at 102 hours, 33 minutes, 4 seconds. We're now 55 seconds from reacquiring Apollo 11 on the 13th revolution. Uh, during this uh, revolution, uh, we will be doing the uh, separation maneuver. We'll also be giving the uh, crew on the, lunar, on the lunar module at go, no go for the descent orbit insertion maneuver. We'll stand by now to reacquire the spacecraft. We 
have confirmation of acquisition of signal. We'll stand by for a call to the crew. Hello, Eagle Houston. We're standing by. Over. Eagle Houston, we Houston, we see you on the stairwell. Over. Roger, Eagle, I'm Dot. Roger, how does it look? The Eagle Neil? has wings. Roger. Looking good. Roger, Neil. We give us who and data. We got the loads for you. Okay, you've got it. Food data. Uh, Roger, and let us know when you're ready to copy. We have a DOI pad the, and a PDI pad. Over. Can check our track and light, Mike. Back off. Okay, I'm ready to start my yaw maneuver, if it suits you, Mike. It would look like you're going to be able to uh, do this without the fan adjusters, Mike. with a DOI pad, 101361407, down 81, minus 00758, plus all balls, plus 00098. Houston, if you'd like to try high gain, pitch 212, y'all, 37, over. I think I've got you on high gain now. Roger. Coming up on one minute to ignition. Yeah. 
Good lock on. You got a lock on? Yeah. Uh, have a good have lights out. Have a good lights out. LA, LA is minus 2,900. Good radar data, altitude now 33,500 feet. Good. 
1,400 feet, still looking very good. Roger, Bravo, we copy it. 35 degrees. 35 degrees. 35 degrees. Prevented good S-band high gain contact, and uh, we had continual communications difficulty in this area, and finally yawed the spacecraft right between 10 and 15 degrees to give the, the high gain antenna more margin. This seemed to enable a satisfactory uh, high bitrate condition, but uh, it did uh, degrade our ability to observe the surface through the LPD and make uh, down and cross range position checks. Uh, as I recall, and, and this is why I kind of like to have those tapes, uh, there was a certain amount of manual tracking being done during this time with the S-band antenna. Uh, during the initial parts of power descent, uh, the auto track did not appear to uh, maintain the highest signal strength. It dropped down to around uh, 3.7 and the ground wanted uh, reacquisition, so I uh, tweaked it up manually. I uh, got the impression that it was not completely impossible to uh, conduct a manual track throughout power descent. Uh, you'd not be able to do very much else beside that. But I think it would be possible to do uh, if you had sets of uh, predetermined values that uh, 
it could set in in case you ever did uh, lose completely. Yeah. DOI ignition, which was our first dips maneuver. I could not hear the uh, engine ignite, couldn't feel it ignite, and I wasn't the only way I was sure that it had in fact ignited was looking at chamber pressure and the accelerometer. Yeah. So very low acceleration level, wasn't wasn't quite ten percent, just off zero. Mm -hmm. And uh, I it was ten percent. Yeah, just doesn't put out the. Oh, I think it would. You stuff. know, after zero g, it'd throw you against your straps one way or the other. It'd be very apparent. So now we're pulled down uh -huh. into the floor with the restraint mm -hmm. already, and mm -hmm. the difference between that yeah. and the 10% uh, throttle acceleration mm -hmm. was not detectable to me. Uh, however, at uh, 15 seconds when we went to 40%, uh, it definitely was. Our downrange uh, position appeared to be good at the uh, minus 3 and minus 1 minute point. Uh, a, the ignition point, uh, I did not accurately, as I was watching the, uh, watching the uh, engine performance, but it appeared to be reasonably cer certain in the, certainly in the right, uh, ball cross range position was black accurately because of the skewed yaw attitude that we were obliged to, to maintain for calm. Uh, however, the downrange position marks after ignition indicated that we were long. Uh, each one that was made indicated that we were two or three seconds uh, long in range. And the fact that throttle up essentially came on time rather than uh, being delayed indicated that the computer, in fact, was a little bit confused in what our downrange position was. Had it known what it was, it would have throttled down later based on engine performance so that uh, we would still hit the right place if, in fact, it was downrange uh, by a couple of seconds. Then it would be it would be late to throttling down to, so that it would break more at a higher throttle level, higher throttle level prior to the pitch. Uh, landmark visibility was uh, was very good. We had no difficulty uh, determining our position throughout all the face down uh, phase of power descent and. Uh, Correlating that with known positions based on the Apollo 10 pictures was very easy and very useful. It was just about at the uh, yaw around maneuver when we, uh, well, I guess trajectory monitoring from the disky up to that point uh, agreed very closely, especially in H dot and VI with the uh, values we had in the altitude values were. Oh, maybe uh, off by something approaching 500 feet. But again, they were again quite close. It was uh, almost immediately after yaw around that, uh, as I recall, the altitude light went out, indicating that we had uh, <coughs> landing radar acquisition and, and lock on, and. Uh, what do you recall it being? 2,300 well, feet, something like that? 20, 26 or 700, I believe, is the number I remember. I think it was plus 26 or 27. Uh, the yaw round was uh, uh, slow. Uh, we had inadvertently left the rate switch in 5 rather than 25. And uh, I was yawing at uh, only a couple degrees per second, as opposed to the five to seven that we'd planned. And uh, the the computer would not hold this rate. Uh, 
say two to one to two degrees a second. It would uh, was jumping uh, uh, up to three and back to actually changing the sign and stopping the roll rate. And it was then that I realized that uh, clearly we weren't rolling as fast as we needed to be. And I noted that uh, we were on the wrong scale switch. And, uh, 25 and put in a five degree per second command and it went went right around. But this uh, delayed us somewhat and uh, consequently we were at a slightly lower altitude at the completion of the yaw round than, than we had expected to be. Uh, so we were probably down to uh, the area 39 or 40,000 feet at the time when uh, we had radar lockup as opposed to about 41,000 that we expected to be at 41.5. I guess the first uh, indications we had of anything going wrong were probably around five minutes or something. When we first started getting uh, uh, program alarm activities. Uh, After the five minute into descent, we started getting a series of uh, program alarms, generally of the series that indicated the computer was being overloaded. Uh, and uh, normally in this time period, we'd normally be evaluating the landing site and uh, checking our position and uh, starting LPD activity. However, the concern here was not with what was the landing area we were going into, but rather could we continue at all? And consequently, our attention was directed toward clearing the program alarms, keeping the machine flying, and uh, and assuring ourselves that control was adequate to uh, continue without requiring a, an abort. And most of the attention was directed inside the cockpit during this time period and uh, in my view this accounts for uh, uh, our inability to to uh, study the, the uh, landing site and final landing location during uh, during final descent it wasn't until uh, we got below 2,000 feet that we were actually able to look out and uh, view the, the, the landing area Okay, looks like it's old. Okay, let me I see something here that answers a question we had before about the AGS uh, residuals and DOI. They were uh, Seven minutes, 30 seconds into one tenth before nulling, and we nulled them to zero. Altitude X was minus 0.1, Y minus 0.4, Z minus 0.1, and we nulled X and Z to zero. And uh, looking at the transcripts, we did have uh, considerable uh, loss of lock approaching PDI. And we did have to uh, reacquire manually several times. Roger, stand by. You're looking great at eight minutes. And it looked like we had some uh, oscillations in the uh, yaw angle on the antenna. And the alarm that we had uh, was 500. And we went to descent 1 and proceeded. And went back to auto again on the landing radar switch. And as this is prior to ignition again, and the ground recommended we yaw right 10 Eagle degrees. Looking great. Coming up nine minutes. Uh, we did not have the uh, radar data feeding to the computer in the LGC position, but apparently, even if you have it in auto track, why there's some some requirement on the computer's uh, time to. This is the way we've been doing it uh, in all simulations. It was our agreed on We were. Yeah, we were. Prior to this time, we'd been in auto track until such time as we started to lose lock in the pitch over, and then we went to slip. Isn't that right?
Altitude 1600. Uh, the, talking about the program alarms during descent? Oh, uh, we'd pass the point of uh, having the uh, rendezvous radar in auto. We'd switched it over to, to SLU at that point. Just left it there. The uh, phase is the P64. I did find time to uh, go out of auto control and into manual and check the manual control in both the pitch and yaw and found its uh, response to be satisfactory and then went zeroed the air needles and went back into auto. Continued the descent in auto at that point. As uh, we approached the 1500 foot point and the uh, program alarm seemed to be settling down and we uh, committed to continue, we could see the landing area and uh, the point at which the LPD was pointing, indicating we were landing just short of uh, quite a large blocky rim crater surrounded with a large uh, boulder field. I initially felt that that might be a good landing area if, if we could stop short of that uh, crater and find a suitable place uh, since it would have a lot of scientific value to, to be in that uh, area close to this large crater. Upon continuing to monitor LPD with, with time, it was obvious that I would not be able to stop sufficiently short of that crater to find a safe landing area and uh, as soon as we determined that we went into manual and I pitched the vehicle over to approximately zero pitch and, and I think I was in the 20 to 30 foot per second horizontal velocity region here over the top of the crater and uh, across the boulder field and then proceeded to look for satisfactory uh, landing area at uh, about 100 feet or a little below 100 feet I first noticed that we were in fact uh, disturbing the, the dust on the surface and we were beginning to get a s transparent sheet of moving uh, dust which obscured the visibility a little bit. As we got lower this visibility degradation continued to increase and uh, don't think that the altitude uh, determination was very hurt by this blowing dust, but the thing that was confusing to me was the fact that it w was hard to pick out what your lateral and downrange velocities were, and that's because you were seeing a lot of moving dust. You had to look through that and pick up the stationary uh, rocks and base your translational vo velocity decisions on, on that, and I found that to be quite difficult, more difficult than I thought it would be, and I spent more attention trying to arrest translational velocities than I thought would be necessary. As we uh, got below 30 feet or so and I had selected the final touchdown area for some reason that I can't be sure, we started to pick up a left translational velocity and a rearward velocity and that's the thing that I certainly didn't want to do because you don't like to be going backwards and be unable to see where you're where you're going so I uh, arrested the backward rate with uh, some possibly spastic uh, control uh, motions but was un unable to stop the left uh, translation and as we approached the ground, I still had a left translational rate, and I was reluctant to uh, to shut the engine off uh, while I still had that rate, and I was also reluctant to uh, slow down my descent rate any more than it was or stop it because we were essentially close to running out of fuel or we were hitting our abort limit. Uh, and so uh, we continued right to touch down a slight left, left, left translation the uh, the touchdown itself I couldn't precisely uh, tell the uh, buzz called uh, lunar contact uh, I didn't I never saw the lunar contact lights I call contact light and I, I'm sure you did but I didn't hear it I didn't see it I heard you say something about contact and I was spring-loaded to the stop engine position there but 
I really don't know uh, whether we had actually touched prior to contact or whether the engine off signal was before contact. In any, in, any, in any case, the engine shutdown was not uh, very high above the surface. It was quite close. And the touchdown itself was, uh, was relatively smooth. There was no tendency toward tipping over that I could tell that it just settled down like a helicopter on the ground and landed. You had a little, uh, what I see here, right drift. And then, uh, then I guess just before a touchdown, we were drifting left, huh? I think I was probably over controlling a little bit in this uh, lateral. I was confused somewhat by the fact that I couldn't really determine what my lateral velocities were as, as closely as I would like to due to the, the dust obscuration of the surface. I could see rocks and craters through this blowing dust. I, I had picked it up at a picked it out earlier at a higher altitude. I, it was my intention to try to pick out the surface spot that I was going to land in at uh, above a hundred feet and pick out it that I could keep my eyes on all the way down through the descent and final touchdown so that uh, I wouldn't in fact be looking at I was going to land and I'd be looking at a place just in front of it and that worked pretty well but uh, again I, I was uh, I was surprised that uh, I had as much trouble as I did in determining translational velocities and being able to control them I, I don't think I did a very good job of uh, Flying the vehicle smoothly in that time period, it was, it was a, a little bit erratic. Okay, engine stop. I think. Uh, the I was feeding data to him all the time. I don't know what he was doing with it. But that was raw computer data. It appeared to be uh, pretty, pretty good. Oh. Yeah, the computer data seemed to be pretty good information, and uh, I'd say that my Visual perception of both altitude and altitude rate was not as good as I thought it was going to be. In other words, I was a little bit more dependent on uh, the information. I think I probably could have made a satisfactory determination of altitude rate uh, just by eye alone, but it wasn't as good as I thought it was going to be. and. Uh, and uh, I think that it's not nearly so good as it is here on Earth, let's say, uh, flying uh, with no big dust plume. Uh, I got the impression by just glimpsing out that after, this was in the area of seeing the shadow the first time when I mentioned that. Mm -hmm. Shortly after that, it, it seemed to me that uh, the horizon out there tended to be obscured by a tan haze. Uh, that may have been just an impression. Now, looking down at maybe 45 degrees, the velocity of, uh, of the what was being kicked up seemed to be uh, no, not not velocity, but the uh, the depth of it seemed to be fairly uh, narrow. In other words, uh, it was scooting along the surface. But since particles were surface, you could see little uh, rocks or little protuberances uh, coming through this, so you knew that it was solid there. You got the distinct impression of that. It wasn't obscured to that point. But it did tend to uh, mask out your ability to detect motion because there was so much motion of things moving out. You had to sort this out as to where it was coming from. There were these few little islands in here that were stationary. And if you could sort that out and, and fix on those, then you could uh, tend to uh, get the impression of uh, being stationary with respect. But it was quite difficult to yeah, do. It. That's right. It's a little, like like, uh, a little bit like uh, <laughs> landing an airplane when there's a real thin layer of ground fog that you're coming through, and you can see things, you know, through the fog, except all this stuff was moving out, at a, all this fog was moving at a great rate, which was a little bit confusing. And I, I would 
think that it would be natural that looking out the left window and seeing this moving this way, you'd get the impression of moving to the right and you'd counteract it by going to the left, which is how we touch down. Since we were moving left, uh, we were yawed slightly to the left so I could get a good view of, of uh, where we were going. I think it was 13 degrees uh, left, and consequently the shadow was not visible to me. It was behind the panel, but Buzz could see it. Then I saw it the, the, in the final phases of descent, I saw the sh shadow come in to view, and it was a very good uh, silhouette picture of the lamb at the time I saw it. Uh, probably a couple hundred feet out in front of the of the uh, whim on the surface. Uh, well, here's it's clearly a useful tool, but I just didn't get to observe it very long. Here's an entry: 46 seconds, 300 feet. Uh, four seconds after the next minute, watch your shadow. And at 16 seconds, 220 feet. So I'd estimate that I called out that shadow business at around 260 feet, and it was certainly plenty large at that point. And uh, looking back on it, I would have said that at 260 feet, that shadow would have been way the hell and gone out there, but it wasn't. It was a good-sized vehicle. I could tell that we had gear down and that we had an ascent stage and a descent stage, and it was of course, illuminated around it with the uh, zero phase uh, sun. Uh, so there was a brightness in the vicinity, but it was readily identifiable. And had I looked out sooner, I'm sure I could have seen something identified as a shadow at uh, 400 feet, maybe, maybe higher. I don't know. But anyway, at this altitude, it, it was usable. Uh, just how you sort that into all the rest of the things that you're looking at. Since the ground is moving, why, it might be of some some aid. But, of course, you have to have it out your window. <laughs> in front of the lamp, that everything is very clearly visible. The surgeon says that camera installed on the ICU bracket. The surgeon says the crew is doing well. Data is good. Crew is doing well. And I'm storing the LEC on the secondary strut.
35 and a half minutes of PLSS time expended now. Houston, uh, do you copy about the contingency sample over? All right, you're going to get to that just as soon as I finish uh, these picture series.
my pocket open, bud? Uh, yes, it is. It's not uh, up against your suit, though. Hit it back once more. Work more toward the inside. Okay, that's good. Put in the pocket? Uh, yeah, push down. Five minutes PLSS time expended. Neil, this is Houston. Based on your camera transfer with the LEC, do you foresee any difficulties in SRC transfer? Over Sure, not to lock. 
second on my way out. <laughs> Hopefully, good thought. That's our home for the next couple of hours. We want to take good care of it. Okay, I'm on the top step, and I can look down over the RCU and find the gear pad. That's a very simple matter to hop down from one step to the next. Yes, I thought it would be very comfortable, and uh, and walking is also very comfortable. You. But you're on. You've got three more steps, and then a long one. BLSS is nominal on consumables.
again, please, Buzz. You're cutting out. And uh, just a minute, please, Buzz. I say that the rocks are rather slippery. Roger. Yeah. Very powdery. Purpose uh, when it's on there, it's to fill up all the uh, very little fine porous. Neil Armstrong uh, getting ready to move the TV camera now out to its panorama position. Traction seems quite good. It's per area. Start to uh, lose my balance in one direction and recovery is quite natural and very easy. Biotite is a brown mica substance. Okay, Houston, I'm going to change lenses on you. Uh, Roger, Neil. Here we got you four sided, but uh, back to one you're side. For those who haven't uh, read the plaque, uh, we'll read the plaque that's on the front landing gear of this lamp. There's, there's two hemispheres, one showing each of the 
two hemispheres of Earth. Underneath it says, Dear men from the planet Earth, first set foot upon the moon, July 1969, A.D. It came in peace for all mankind. It has the, the crew members' signatures and the signature of the President of the United States. stand on the ladder facing forward, the minus Y strut is the landing gear to your left. Hey, I am, bud. 20, 50 feet, why don't you turn around and let, uh, let them get a view from there and uh, okay. see what the field of view looks like. You're backing into the cable. Okay. 
just leave it. All right, let it sit like that and walk around it. Uh, Houston, how's that field of view uh, going to be? Pick up uh, the Mesa. Long way. Good. Uh, Neil, this is Houston. The field of view is okay. We'd like you to aim it a little bit more to the right. Over. Okay. One 
hour, seven minutes time expended. Okay, you can make a mark, Houston. Roger, following. Buzz is erecting the solar wind experiment now. system is still looking good. Columbia, Columbia, this is Houston and ALS, over. Houston and ALS, over. 
Neil Armstrong has been on the lunar surface now almost 45 minutes. Neil, this is Houston, radio check over. Evaluate the uh, 
various paces that a person can traveling on the surface. I believe I'm out of your field of view. Is that right now, Houston? That's uh, affirmative, Buzz. You're in our field of view now. You do have to be. All right, you do have to be uh, rather careful uh, to keep track of where your center of mass is. Sometimes it takes about two or three spaces to uh, make sure that uh, you've got your feet underneath you. And about two or three or maybe four easy spaces can bring you to a fairly smooth
Roger, Buzz, and Break Break Columbia. This is Houston. When you track out of high gain antenna limits, request Omni Delta. Omni Delta, over. Oh, man. I've noticed several times it's going from the uh, uh, sunlight into the shadow that just as I go in, I catch an additional uh, reflection off the lamp. This is Houston. You're cutting out on the end of your transmission. Can you uh, speak a little more closely into your microphone over? been on the surface an hour now. Oh, buzz, not quite 20 minutes less than that. In general, uh, time spent uh, in the shadow doesn't seem to uh, have any
Columbia, this is Houston, over. Houston, Columbia, Delta. Oh, Roger, you should have VHF AOS with the LEM right about now. VHF LOS will be at uh, four zero minutes, one five seconds, over. rates on both crewmen averaging uh, between 90 and 100. Flight surgeon reports they're uh, right on the predicted number of the uh, BTU uh, units expended in energy of work. And he thinks they're in great shape. You can see Neil Armstrong bringing scoop. Around, I'll be taking about 30 to 40 feet uh, out the bus. But uh, again, which sure strut is buzz? So it would be again, with, with the, the uh, plus V strut. Roger. And, uh, right in this area, there are two craters. Uh, the one that's right in front of me now, as I look off in about the uh, 11 o'clock position, about uh, 30 to uh, 35 feet 
Neil is filling the bulk sample bag attached to a scale. You can see him in the picture. Buzz is behind the limb at the minus Z strut. That's the landing gear directly opposite the ladder. Neil's been on the surface about an hour and ten minutes now. Buzz is making his way around the limb, photographing it from various angles, uh, looking at its condition on all sides. N Neil's still occupied with the uh, bulk sample. expended on the PLSSs now. You're breaking up again. 
again, Buzz. Roger, and Neil has Uh, Neil and Buzz, this is Houston. Uh, to clarify my last, uh, are uh, in good shape at this time. The 30 minutes reference was with respect to the nominal timeline. Over.
Neil's been on the surface now uh, slightly over an hour and 20 minutes. Okay, I'm ready to pull it down now. There was still 
a little bit uh, left in the... Okay, don't hold it quite so tight. Surgeon says that camera installed on the ICU bracket. Surgeon says the crew is doing well. Data is good. Crew is doing well. And I'm storing the LEC on the secondary strut. Five and a half minutes of PLSS time expended now. Houston, uh, do you copy about the contingency sample over?
Neil, uh, this is Houston. We're getting a picture. You're not in at the present time. We can see the bag on the LEC being moved by Buzz, though. Here you come into our field of view. Five minutes PLSS time expended. Neil, this is Houston. Based on your camera transfer with the LEC, do you foresee any difficulties in SRC transfer? Or difficulties in SRC? Negative. 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 That's the sample return containers, the rock boxes that Capcom.
PLSS is nominal on consumables. Again, please, Buzz, you're cutting out. And I uh, just want please, Buzz. I say that the rocks are rather slippery. Roger. Very powdery surface uh, when it's on there. It's fill up all the uh, very little fine porous. Armstrong uh, getting ready to move the TV camera now out to its panorama position.
Okay, so seems to be in good shape. You have to be careful that you're leaning in the direction you want to go, otherwise you uh, might be an eight feet. In other words, you have to cross your foot over to stay underneath where your center of mass is. I say we might see some purple rocks. Find the purple rock? Yep. Very small, sparkly uh, fragments are uh, rock. They're like the sun in places. I would uh, make a first guess that Biotite is a brown mica substance. Okay, Houston, I'm going to change lenses on you. Uh, Roger, Neil. Here we've got you four sided, but uh, back to one you're side.
are very finely powdered carbon. But pretty, pretty looking. You uh, pull out some of my cable for me, but. stand on the ladder facing forward, the minus Y strut is the landing gear to your left. Hey, I am, bud. 40, 50 feet, why don't you turn around and let, uh, let them get a view from there and uh, okay. see what the field of view looks like. You're backing into the cable. Okay. Sweet, you're going to have to stop for... Stop 
I haven't stopped, I haven't set it down yet. That's the first picture in the panorama, right there. Seven minutes time expended. Okay, you can make a mark, Houston. Roger, follow in. solar wind experiment now. Thank you. 
will retain a uh, slope of probably 70 degrees uh, on the side of the system still looking good. Columbia, Columbia, this is Houston and ALS over. Houston and ALS over. Neil has been on the lunar surface now almost 45 minutes.
Neil, this is Houston, radio check over. Delta, over. Oh, man. I've 
noticed several times in going from the uh, uh, sunlight into the shadow that just as I go in, I catch an additional uh, reflection off the lamp, uh, along with the reflection off my face onto the visor, makes visibility very poor, just that the uh, transition sunlight into the shadow. I uh, essentially have so much glare coming onto my visor, I'm not shadow, so uh, my helmet actually gets shadow, and then it takes a short while for my eyes to adapt to the fighting condition. I'm inside the uh, shadow area. Visibility, as we've said before, is not too great, but uh, both visors up. I don't know, we can certainly get what sort of footprints we have and the general condition of the soil. And after being out in the sunlight mile, it takes. Uh, watch it, Neil. Neil, you're on the cable. Okay. Yeah, lift up your right foot. Right foot. Uh, it's still, your toe is still hooked in it. Yeah, it's still hooked in it. I'm in. Okay, you're clear now. Thank you. Now, let's, uh, let's move that over this way. Neil Armstrong has the scoop for the bulk sample collection. This is Houston. You're cutting out on the end of your transmission. Can you uh, speak a little more closely into your microphone over? Neil's been on the surface an hour now. Oh, Buzz, not quite 20 minutes less than that.
Columbia. This is Houston. Over. Houston, Columbia, Delta. Oh, Roger, you should have VHF ALS with the LEM right about now. VHF LOS will be at uh, 4 zero minutes, 1 5 seconds. Over. Heart rates on both crewmen averaging uh, between 90 and 100. Flight surgeon reports they're uh, right on the predicted number of the uh, BTU uh, units expended in energy of work. And he thinks they're in great shape. I look around the area, the, uh, the contrast in general is... Uh by virtue of the shadows, almost feet, um, looking down sun, zero phase, very light colored gray, light gray colored, like the halo um, around my own shadow, around the shadow of my uh, helmet. Uh, then as I look uh, off cross sun, the contrast becomes uh, the strongest in that the uh, surrounding uh, color is still fairly light. As you look down into the sun, but a larger amount of that uh, out area is looking toward us. Uh, the general color of the surrounding You can see Neil Armstrong bringing scoop. I'll be taking about 30 to 40 feet uh, out the bus. But uh, again, which strut is the The plus V strut. Roger. And, uh, right in this area, there are two craters. Uh, the one that's right in front of me now, as I look off in about the uh, 11 o'clock position from about uh, 30 to uh, 35 feet across. 
several uh, uh, boxes of boulders, uh, six, eight inches across, varying sizes. Neil is filling the bulk sample bag attached to it. You can see him in the picture. Buzz is behind the limb at the minus Z strut. That's the landing gear directly opposite the ladder. Neil's been on the surface about an hour and ten minutes now. I'm now in the area of the uh, minus Y strut. Buzz is making his way around the limb, photographing it from various angles, uh, looking at its condition on all sides. N Neil still occupied with the uh, bulk sample. One hour, 40 minutes time expended on the PLSSs now. How's the bulk sample coming, Neil? Bulk sample is just being sealed. And Columbia, this is Houston while I'm talking to you. LOS will be at 111 and 1.
one niner three one ALS one one two zero five four three over This is Houston. Did you copy LOS, AOS signs? Over. and Neil has
Houston has their timeline after to be going. Well, Roger, uh, it looks like you're about a half hour uh, slow on it. We're working on consumables, over. Neil and Buzz, this is Houston. Uh, to clarify my lab, uh, your consumables are uh, in good shape at this time. The 30 minutes reference was with respect to the nominal timeline. Over. Neil's been on the surface now lately. Right rear of the spacecraft, looking at the uh, skirts of the 
descent stage. So uh, a slight darkening of the surface color, uh, a rather minimal amount of uh, uh, radiating uh, or etching away or erosion of the surface. And now uh, on descent, uh, both of us remarked that we could see a large amount of uh, very fine uh, dust particles moving out. beforehand that uh, we would probably see an outgassing from the surface after um, actual engine shutdown, but uh, I recall uh, I was unable to verify that.
lamb now. Step off the lamb now. That's one small step for man. Surgeon says that camera installed on the ICU bracket. Surgeon says the crew is doing well. Data is good. Crew is doing well. And I'm storing the LEC on the secondary stretch.
I'll step out and take some of my first pictures here. Uh, Roger, Neil, we're reading you loud and clear. Let's see, you're getting some pictures and uh, the contingency sample. Thirty-five and a half minutes of PLSS time expended now. Houston, uh, do you copy about the contingency sample over? All right, you're going to get to that just as soon as I finish uh, these picture series. I'm sure I could push it in farther, but uh, it's hard for me to bend down farther. 
of the net. Five minutes PLSS time expended.
Neil, this is Houston. Based on your camera transfer with the LEC, all these in SRC transfer. All these in SRC. Negative. That's the sample return containers, the rock boxes that Capcom. No, I want to uh, back up and partially close that. PLSS is nominal on consumables.
Say again, please, Buzz, you're cutting out. And I uh, just want please, Buzz. I say that the rocks are rather slippery. Roger. Very powdery. Armstrong uh, getting ready to move the TV camera now out to its panorama position. Biotite is a brown mica substance. Okay, Houston, I'm going to change lenses on you. Uh, Roger, Neil.
Roger, we've got you four sided, but uh, back to one got side. You four -sided.
right strut is the landing gear to your left. Hey, I am, bud. 20, 50 feet, why don't you turn around and let, uh, let them get a view from there and uh, okay. see what view looks like. You're backing into the cable. Okay. Roger, and we see Buzz going about his work. How's that for a final, uh, uh, 
for a final orientation, we'd like it to come left about uh, five degrees over. Uh, back to the right about half as much. Okay. Okay, that looks good there, Neil. Seven minutes time expended. Okay, you can make a mark, Houston. Roger, follow in. the solar wind experiment now. All limb systems still looking good.
Columbia, Columbia, this is Houston and ALS over. Neil Armstrong's been on the lunar surface now almost 45 minutes. Houston reading you loud and clear over. Yeah, this is Houston reading. Yeah, read you loud and clear. How's it going? Roger, the EVA is progressing beautifully. Uh, I believe they're setting up the flag now. Great. I guess you're about the only person around that doesn't have TV coverage of the scene. Neil, this is Houston, radio check over. Hi, Roger, Houston, loud and clear. Roger out. Loud and clear, Houston. Roger, bud.
contemplate the uh, various paces that a person can traveling on the surface. I believe I'm out of your field of view. Is that right now, Houston? Uh, that's affirmative, Buzz. You're in our field of view now. You do have to be. All right, you do have to be uh, rather careful uh, to keep track of where your center of mass is. Sometimes it takes about two or three spaces to uh, make sure that uh, you've got your feet underneath you. Thank you, Mr. President. It's a great honor and privilege for us to be here representing not only the United States, but and a peace of all nations and with interest and a curiosity.
Landmark ID, LEM. T1-110-26-5-0. One one zero three two zero six three miles south. Time of closest approach one one zero three three four zero. Shaft three five three decimal eight five five. Trunnion four six. Decimal four nine or five. Roll zero. Pitch two five zero. Yaw zero. Over. Buzz, 
this is Houston. You're cutting out on the end of your transmission. Can you uh, speak a little more closely into your microphone over? Roger, I'll try that. Beautiful. Now I had that one inside my mouth that time. Sounded a little wet. A little wet. Neil's been on the surface an hour now. Buzz, not quite 20 minutes less than that. In general, uh, time spent uh, in the shadow doesn't seem to uh, have any uh, thermal effects. Uh, we still inside the suit. Uh, there is a difference, uh, of course, in the uh, coming radiation and helmet, so I think there's a tendency to feel a little cooler in the uh, shadow than we uh, feel out in the sun. Columbia, this is Houston, over. One hour and a half expended on the PLSSs now. Columbia, this is Houston, over. Columbia, this is Houston, over. Houston, Columbia, Delta. Roger, you should have VHF AOS with the LEM right about now. VHF LOS will be at uh, four zero minutes, one five seconds, over. Heart rates on both crewmen averaging uh, between 90 and 100. Flight surgeon reports they're uh, right on the predicted number of the uh, BTU units expended in energy of work. And he thinks they're in great shape. I look around the area, the, uh, the contrast in general is uh, by virtue of the shadows up on the feet up down sun girl phase very light colored gray light gray colored like the halo uh, around my own shadow around the shadow of my uh, helmet uh, then as I look uh, 
toward us. You can see Neil Armstrong bringing scoop. I'll be taking about 30 to 40 feet uh, out the bus. Uh, Neil Armstrong has been taking filling the bulk sample bag at in the picture. Buzz is behind the lamb at the minus Z strut. That's the landing gear directly opposite the ladder. Neil's been on the surface about an hour and ten minutes now.
Buzz is making his way around the limb, photographing it from various angles, uh, looking at its condition on all sides. Neil's still occupied with the uh, bulk sample. One hour, 40 minutes time expended on the PLSSs now. And Columbia, this is Houston while I'm talking to you. LOS will be at 111-19-31. ALS 112-05-43. Over. Houston, did you copy LOS, AOS signs? Over.
Neil and Buzz, this is Houston. Uh, to clarify my last, uh, your consumables are uh, in good shape at this time. 
the 30 minute reference was with respect to the nominal timeline over. Neil's been on the surface now uh, slightly over an hour and 20 minutes.
take an angle, Neil. The laser reflector. They're open, and it looks like they're going to stay up without any problem. Columbia, Columbia, this is Houston. We're about to lose you on the Omnis. Request high gain antenna. React mode. Pitch two zero. Yellow one three five. Over. Make that yaw 175, Columbia, yaw 175 on the high gain. Columbia's locked up on the high gain, Houston. Right, you're out. Surgeon says everything looks fine. An hour and a half of lunar surface time for Neil Armstrong. They've been on the portable life support systems for two hours now. And the manual uh, deployment of the uh, LR cubed. Uh, That's Neil Armstrong to the left of the screen. By that doors are closed and locked. Ground there and uh, watch it 
the edge of that crater. Uh, yeah, that's how soft off there, isn't it? Buzz Aldrin coming into view on the right, carrying the two experiments. About 40 feet out, I'd say out to the end of that next... Uh... Well, it's going to be a little difficult to find a good level spot here. Uh, top of that next little ridge there, isn't that, wouldn't that be a pretty good place? And they will be out of the camera's field of view while setting up these experiments. Seismic experiment uh, over now, and I'm aligning it, but I'm, I'm having a little bit of difficulty getting the beat going to center. Wants to uh, move around and around on the outside. Oh, you're cutting out again, boys.
the uh, laser reflector is uh, installed and the bubble level and uh, the alignment uh, appears to be good. Nails is Houston, Roger out. discussing is on a leveling device on the uh, passive size monitor. Neil, this is Houston, over. Thank uh -huh. 
Uh, two two twelve is the time expended on the uh, PLSS. This is Houston. If you're still in the vicinity of the PSC, could you get a photograph? I'll I'll do that, sir. Uh, Neil, this is Houston. Uh, we're estimating about 10, 10 minutes for the document sampling. Over. Columbia, Columbia, this is Houston. Over. Terminate charging battery Bravo at uh, 111 plus 15. Over. Uh, Buzz, this is Houston. Uh, you've got about 10 minutes left now prior to commencing your EVA termination activities. Over. Uh, Tranquility Base, this is Houston. The passive seismic experience has been uncaged, and we're observing short period oscillations in it. Over. Neil Armstrong has been on the surface now about an hour and 50 minutes.
In the foreground, Buzz Aldrin is collecting a core tube sample. I hope you're watching uh, how hard I have to hit this into the ground uh, to the tune of about five inches, Houston. Roger. The core tubes provide material. Get the next one. Maybe you can get, turn away the box a little bit. I'll take care. This is Houston. You have approximately three minutes until you must commence your EVA termination activities. Over. Roger, understand. Okay, this is Houston. Approximately one minute to LOS. Over. And one minute. And you plan on uh, commencing your sleep on the back side this path? Uh, if so, we'll disable uplink to you while we're talking to the lamb. Over. I got the cap. Got the cap? They're both good cap. 
Uh, Buzz, this is Houston. It's about time for you to start your EVA closeout activities. They've been on their life support system on their life support systems two hours and twenty five minutes. to the right of the screen. Yeah. Neil and Buzz, this is Houston. I'd like to remind you of the close-up camera magazine before you start up the ladder, Buzz. Keep a good margin in those portable life support systems.
white dot right above the horizon on the right is a phosphorus spot from the TV converter in the park station in Australia. Neil's been on the surface a few minutes longer than two hours. Buzz, uh, approximately 20 minutes less than that. Uh, Neil, this is Houston. Did the Hasselblad magazine go off on that uh, sample return container also?
Transferring the sample containers into the limb cabin now. Uh-oh. Camera came off. Maybe the film bag came off. The Lick Observatory in California reports a return on the laser experiment. Hey, and Bugs, for your information, your consumables remain in good shape. Uh Okay. 
Okay, I'll get it the rest of the way. Okay. And I'll give it to you to uh, pull away in just a second. And a little more. Two hours, 40 minutes on the PLSSs. Neil, Mr. Houston, did you get the Asshole Boy magazine? Mr. Houston, did you get the Asshole Boy magazine? Yes, I did. And we got about, uh, I'd say, 20 pounds of uh, carefully selected, if not documented, samples. Houston, Roger, well done, Al. Get the second box. Unofficial time off the surface at 111.37.32. Arch, now start arching your back. That's good. Plenty of room. Plenty room. All right, arch your back a little. Your head up again. Your plant antenna suit. This is Houston, go ahead.
Well, you're cutting out, Neil. Uh, you're not readable. I uh, understand you said something about a contingency sample container on the uh, S N engine. Oh, you're not reading you, Neil. Buzz, buzz. This is Houston. Do you read over? Uh, tranquility Base. This is Houston. We're reading neither one of you, but standing by. Cabin pressure coming up uh, about 2.789 pounds. Up to three now. Four PSI now. show the cabinet The laser reflector. They're open, and it looks like they're going to stay up without any problem. Columbia, Columbia, this is Houston. We're about to lose you on the Omnis. Request high gain antenna. React mode. Pitch two zero. Yaw one three five. Over. Make that yaw 175, Columbia, yaw 175 on the high game. Columbia locked up on the high game, Houston. Roger out.
surgeon says everything looks fine. An hour and a half of lunar surface time for Neil Armstrong. They've been on the portable life support systems for two hours now. And the manual uh, deployment of the uh, LR cubed. Uh, at the end of the string pulled off of the uh, pit fin. Now, however, I was able to reach up and get hold of the pit fin and pull it loose. So uh, it'll be deployed manually also. Roger. That's Neil Armstrong to the left of the screen. By that doors are closed and locked. Okay. Have you got us a good area picked up? Well, I think right out on that rise out there is probably as good as any. Buzz Aldrin coming into view on the right, carrying the two experiments. About 40 feet out, I'd say out to the end of that next... Uh... Well, it's going to be a little difficult to find a good level spot here. Uh, top of that next little ridge there, isn't that, wouldn't that be a pretty good place?
and they will be out of the camera's field of view while setting up these experiments. Houston, I have the, uh, the seismic experiment uh, it's over now, and I'm aligning it with the sun. I'm having a little bit of difficulty getting the beef to go in the center. It wants to uh, move around and around on the outside. Oh, you're cutting out again, boys. The uh, weather reflector is uh, installed and the bubbles level and uh, the alignment uh, appears to be good. Neil, is this Houston? Roger out. Hey, you want to take a look at this BB, see what you're making on it? I found it pretty hard to get uh, perfectly level too. My baby likes 
the outside. It won't go on the inside. discussing is on a leveling device on the uh, passive size monitor. You did successfully deploy both solar arrays over. Neil, this is Houston, over. No, this is Houston, over. Hey, go ahead, Houston. All right, you've been looking at your consumables, and you're in, you're in good shape. Uh, subject to your concurrence, we'd like to extend the duration of the EVA one five minutes from nominal. We will still give Buzz a hack at ten minutes prior for uh, heading in your current Elapsed time is 2 plus 12, over. Okay, that sounds fine. Roger up. expended on the uh, PLSS. This is Houston. If you're still in the vicinity of the PSC, could you get a photograph of the ball level? Over. I'll, I'll do that, but... Oh, 
shoot. Believe the ball is right in the middle now. Wonderful. Take a picture for it moves. Uh, Neil, this is Houston. Uh, we're estimating about 10, 10 minutes for the document sampling. Over. Columbia, Columbia, this is Houston. Over. Like you to terminate charging battery Bravo at uh, 111 plus 15. Over. Uh, Buzz, this is Houston. Uh, you've got about 10 minutes left now prior to commencing your EVA termination activities. Over. Tranquility Base, this is Houston. The passive seismic experience has been uncaged, and we're observing short period oscillations in it. Over. Neil Armstrong has been on the surface now about an hour and 50 minutes.
In the foreground, Buzz Aldrin is collecting a core tube sample. I hope you're watching uh, how hard I have to hit this into the ground uh, to the tune of about five inches, Houston. Roger. The core tubes provide material. Get the next one. Maybe you can get, get away the box a little bit. I'll take care. This is Houston. You have approximately three minutes until you must commence your EVA termination activities. Over. Columbia, this is Houston. Approximately one minute to LOS. Over. And you plan on uh, commencing your sleep on the back side this path? Uh, if so, we'll disable uplink to you while we're talking to the lamb. Over.
Buzz Aldrin retrieving the solar wind experiment. Uh, Buzz, this is Houston. It's about time for you to start your EVA closeout activities. Roger. They've been on their life support system. On their life support systems, two hours and twenty-five minutes. Neil appears to be picking up rocks to the right of the screen. Yeah. Neil and Buzz, this is Houston. I'd like to remind you of the close up camera magazine before you start up the ladder, Buzz. Roger, Neil, and Buzz. Uh, let's uh, press on with getting the close-up camera out of the sample. Return we'll we'll container. You're running a little low on time. Roger. We want to keep a good margin in those portable life support systems. Okay, can you quickly take this in my pocket now and I'll yep. head on up the ladder.
that white dot right above the horizon on the right is a phosphorus spot from the TV converter in the park station in Australia. Neil's been on the surface a few minutes longer than two hours. Buzz, uh, approximately 20 minutes less than that. Uh, Neil, this is Houston. Did the Hasselblad magazine go off on that uh, sample return container also?
Transferring the sample containers into the limb cabin now. Uh-oh. Camera came off. I mean, the film bag came off. Houston, uh, request an EMU check over. The Lick Observatory in California reports a return on the laser. Hey, and Buzz, for your information, your consumables remain in good shape. Huh? Now. 
Okay, I'll get it the rest of the way. Okay. And I'll give it to you to uh, pull away just a second. And a little more. Two hours, 40 minutes on the PLSSs. Unofficial time off the surface at 111.37.32. Uh, uh, start arching your back. That's good. Plenty of room. Here, I'm right. Arch your back a little. Your head up again. This is Houston, go ahead. You're cutting out, Neil. Uh, you're not readable. Uh, I understand you said something about a contingency sample container on the uh, SN engine.
cabin pressure coming up uh, about 2.789 pounds. Up to three now. Four PSI now. Show the cabin at four point eight now. Uh, 
Roger. GNC flight. And we're about uh, 95 or 100 degrees east, uh, coming up on okay. flight C. Still holding? Okay. Uh, Sorry, again, 11. I say again, we're about 95 degrees east, coming up on flight C. Uh, Roger, and for your information, we show you at an altitude of about 92 miles above the surface right now. Okay. Uh, it's in Apollo 11. Did you uh, observe a difference in the uh, uh, N2 uh, pressures before LOI? It seems to me as though uh, the two were not uh, equal in the same back. Uh, uh, B tank was at a lower pressure level. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, I'm flying it in FDS minimum impulse, Houston, and uh, it's uh, rather difficult to keep it on a constant theta. The, the limb uh, wants to wander up and down. I'm not sure in response to mass cons or what, but uh, I can get it completely stabilized in theta and uh, let it alone, and in another couple of minutes it will have developed its own rate. This is Houston, Roger. Uh, Houston, we'll be moving shortly uh, from the side window to the uh, hatch window, and uh, we'll try and pick up some of the uh, landmines that we'll be uh, looking at as we approach uh, power descent. Over. 11, this is Houston, Roger, and we're through with the uplink. Computer is yours. You can go to block, and we'll have the information on nitrogen for you uh, shortly. Over.
digging, the uh, tendency seems to be to pull the limb down toward uh, uh, the center of the moon as in a gravity gradient experiment. Uh, Roger, 11, we copy. Uh, may have something to do with mass guns or may. Uh, Roger, we've got the... Uh, uh, may have something to do with mass guns or may just be the peculiarity of the disk you display. Okay, we've observed the behavior of your disky. Uh, I think we've got the data here to work on it. Uh, let us grind around a little while on it, and we'll report back to you uh, uh, probably in a rev or two. Okay, well, in the meantime, I'm going to pitch down uh, toward 315. Roger. Three craters, three horizontal craters we now have in the field of view are uh, immediately underneath the ground track. The right hand and the largest crater that you see is to the Agro T. Roger, we concur on the identification of that crater. up on uh, landmark Alpha 1 here shortly. Roger, uh, Mike's having his first look at Alpha 1 at the present time. Yeah, it's a great uh, bright crater. It's not a large one, but an extremely bright one. It looks like a very uh, recent, and I would guess, impact crater with uh, rays streaming out in all directions, which uh, should make uh, my other correction the foaming sea easy to see coming up on it. Now, uh, Crater Camp is one of the smaller ones out on the uh, on the floor of the foaming sea. Okay, we show you uh, over the, the Sea of Fertility now, and uh, you ought to have Langrenus uh, down south of the track a few degrees, about uh, nine degrees south of the track. Yeah, the crater that's in the center of the screen now is uh, Webb. Uh, we'd be looking straight down on it at about six minutes before power descent. It uh, has a relatively flat bottom uh, to the crater, and you can see maybe uh, or three uh, craters that are in the bottom of it. On the uh, western wall, the wall that's now nearest to, to the uh, camera, or near the bottom of the screen, we can see uh, a temple crater just on the outside. And then coming back toward the bottom of the screen and to the left, you can see uh, a, a uh, depression. Uh, it's this type of uh, connected craters that uh, give us most uh, interest to uh, discover why they're in uh, the particular patterns that they're in. I'll zoom the camera in uh, and try and give you a little closer look at this. Roger, we're uh, observing the Dimple Crater now. Uh, the central peak that we can see on the orbiter photos doesn't seem to stand out very well here. Well, they're not central peaks, they're uh, depressions in the center. Right. And you'll notice on the uh, pitch thruster activity, I've, still, I've put in uh, oh, a dozen uh, minimum impulses and pitched down, uh, and I'm still far from correcting back to 315. We're moving the camera over to the uh, right window now to give you uh, language. It's, uh, it's uh, several central peaks. And, uh, Roger. Uh, we got Langrenus in our screen now. Okay, 
Okay, 11, this is Houston. Uh, we're getting a beautiful picture of uh, Langrenus now with its uh, rather conspicuous central peak. And in the right-hand portion of our screen right now, we can see Messier, Alpha, and Bravo with uh, the light-colored rays uh, streaming off in one direction.
Okay, this is uh, very close to ignition point for power defense. Uh, just passing Mount Maryland, that's uh, a triangular shaped mountain that you see in the uh, center of the screen at the present time with the crater Seki Sheda uh, on top of the far northern edge of the mountain. I did, we're getting very good. U.S. 
trail is the one that was referred to in Apollo 10 as Sidewinder. Good name, too. Sidewinder Diamondback. Looks like a couple of snakes down there in the lake bed. Uh, we're making it get smaller and smaller here to make sure that it really is the 
when we're leaving. Oh, yeah, I forgot to you guys. Now there's a, a lot of scientists from uh, a number of countries standing by to see the lunar samples, and uh, we thought you'd be interested in seeing that they really are here. Uh, these two boxes are the sample return containers. They, they are vacuum packed uh, containers that were closed in a vacuum on the lunar surface. Don't and then uh, brought inside the lab and put inside uh, these fiberglass bags, zippered and resealed around the outside, around the outside, and placed in these uh, receptacles in the side of the command module. These are the two boxes, and uh, as soon as we uh, get onto the ship, I'm sure these uh, boxes will immediately be uh, transferred uh, and uh, delivery started to the litter receiving laboratory. Uh, these boxes include the samples of the various types of rock, the uh, ground mass of the soil, the sand and silt, and uh, the uh, particle collector for the solar wind experiment, and uh, the cortex that took uh, depth samples of the lunar surface. Uh, Roger, Neil. Thank you much for that description. Uh, we've got a pretty dark picture down here. Could you check your F-side? A little bit over. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay, our monitor showed that to be very bright. Yeah, right. we're, we're down around uh, between well, around F4, which we thought would be plenty light. Uh, we'll lighten it up some more. Well, we'd appreciate it. It's uh, pretty dark, dark on all our monitors here. Okay, fine. That's looking a lot better now, Neil. There's Buzz. Houston, we have an excellent picture now, over. Yeah, how do you read me, Charlie? Uh, five by now, Buzz, over. Okay. Uh, more mundane affair, not as successful as I'd like to see what's taking place in the uh, food department. I'm sure you've always type of a uh, drink container. A little later, Mike will show you how the uh, water gun uh, operates with its new uh, filter to take out the uh, hydrogen. Essentially, this uh, water gun is put in, in this end and filled up this bag with water, and the uh, drink then uh, dissolves in the water, and uh, 
this end of the now proceeding. Uh, likewise, we have uh, other proofs that are more solid nature. You can probably see this uh, shrimp cocktail meal. This afternoon, while the two of us had uh, salmon salad. Another early development was the uh, use of bite sized food. Eleven, Houston, uh, but you're breaking up badly. Yeah, uh, uh, will you check your box over? All right, sir. How am I coming through now, Charlie? All right, yeah, you're very clear when you come through. It's just that your box is not uh, keying at uh, every word. Over. Okay. These bite-sized uh, objects were designed to uh, uh, remove the problem of having so many crumbs floating around in the cabin. So they designed uh, a particular size that uh, would be able to uh, go into the mouth all at once. I think since uh, all of our experience, we've discovered that we can uh, progress a good bit further than that back to uh, some of the type meals that uh, we have on Earth. As a matter of fact, on this flight, we've carried along pieces of bread. And uh, along with the bread, we have uh, a uh, ham spread. And I'll show you, I hope. How easy it is to spread some ham. Five minutes for a that uh, it is quite easy to offer a with. Apollo 11, Houston, we noticed your roll rate increasing. Uh, would you please uh, see if you can uh, bring that uh, down to about zero for us, so we'll be losing a high gain shortly. Over. You can also use uh, zero gravity to demonstrate uh, many things that we've all learned in school. I'd like to demonstrate uh, briefly uh, how easy it is to explain the action of a gyroscope. Uh, if I spin this can, we know that uh, according to the uh, equations of uh, uh, motion that we would expect that if once this is given a spin about, and has a spin axis in this direction, if we give it a particular torque, and if I, I'll do this by pushing my hands against it in this fashion once it's spinning, by the equations we can predict that as I put this torque on it, it will in fact Rotate this direction. Let's see how well this works out. And as I apply the torque this way, it rotated this way. He said, pretty good demonstration. Houston, this next is a little demonstration for the kids at home, all kids everywhere for that matter. Uh, I was going to show you how you drink water out of a spoon, but I'm afraid I filled a spoon too full and uh, 
If I'm not careful, I'm going to throw water right over the side. Can you can you see the water flapping around on the top of the spoon, kid? That's affirmative, hello. Okay, well, as I say, I was going to show you, but I'm afraid I filled it too full and it's going to spill over the side. I tell you what, I just I just turn this one over and uh, get rid of the water and start all over again, okay? Okay. And you can see up here we know where over is. Uh, one uh, up is as good as another. That really is water, though, I'll show you. That's really not the way we drink. We really have a water gun, which I'll show you. There's the water gun. That cylindrical thing on the end of it is a uh, filter with uh, several membranes. One allows uh, water to pass, but not any gas. The other allows gas to pass, but not any water. So by routing uh, the gaseous water, which comes from our uh, tank, through this filter, we're able to uh, drink purified water without the gas in it, filtered water. And uh, of course, all we do to uh, to get it started is just pull the trigger. Sort of messy. I haven't been at this very long. It's sort of the same system that the Spaniards used to drink out of wine skins at bull fights. Only I think it's be more fun. Well, be seeing you, kids. Uh, thank you from all the kids in the world uh, here in the Moker who uh, can't tell the earth from the moon. <laughs> all right, just stand by one and we'll get you that earthquake. Good evening. This is the 
commander of Apollo 11. A hundred years ago, Jules Verne wrote a book about a voyage to the moon. His spaceship, Columbia, took off from Florida and landed in the Pacific Ocean after completing a trip to the moon. It's appropriate to us to share with you some of the reflections of the crew as the modern day Columbia completes its rendezvous with the planet Earth and the same Pacific Ocean tomorrow. First, Mike Collins. Roger, this trip of ours to the moon may have looked to you simple or easy. I'd like to assure you that that has not been the case. The Saturn V rocket, which put us into orbit, is an incredibly complicated piece of machinery, every piece of which works flawlessly. This computer up above my head has a 38,000 word vocabulary, each word of which has been very carefully chosen to be of the utmost value to us, the crew. The switch, which I have in my hand now, has over 300 counterparts in the command module alone. There's one single switch design. In addition to that, there are a myriad of circuit breakers, levers, rods, and other associated controls. The SPS engine, our large rocket engine, on the aft end of our service module, must have performed flawlessly or we would have been stranded in lunar orbit. The parachutes up above my head must work perfectly tomorrow or we will plummet into the ocean. We have always had confidence that all this equipment will work and work properly, and we continue to have confidence that it will do so for the remainder of the flight. All this is possible only through the blood, sweat, and tears of a number of people the American workmen who put these pieces of machinery together at the factory. Second, the painstaking work done by the various test teams during the assembly and the retest after assembly. And finally, the people at the Manned Spacecraft Center, both in management, in mission planning, in flight control, and last but not least, in crew training. This operation is somewhat like the periscope of a submarine. All you see is the three of us, but beneath the surface are thousands and thousands of others. And to all those, I would like to say thank you very much. This is Houston. We're getting a good picture of Buzz now, but no voice modulation. And would you open up on the, the TV camera? Uh, try a tutu, please. That appears to be a lot better now. We're still not receiving Buzz's audio. Good evening. I'd like to discuss with you a few of the more symbolic aspects of the flight of our mission, Apollo 11. As we've been discussing the events that have taken place in the past two or three days here on board our spacecraft, we've come to the conclusion that this has been far more than three men on a voyage to the moon. More still than the efforts of a government and industry team more even than the efforts of one nation. We feel that this stands as a symbol of the insatiable curiosity of all mankind to explore the unknown. Neil's statement the other day upon first setting foot on the surface of the moon, this is a small step for a man, but a great leap for mankind, I believe sums up these feelings very nicely. We accept 
accepted the challenge of going to the moon, the acceptance of this challenge was inevitable. The relative ease with which we carried out our mission, I believe, is a tribute to the timeliness of that acceptance. Of accepting expanded roles in the exploration of space. In retrospect, we have all been particularly pleased with the call signs that we very laboriously chose for our spacecraft, Columbia and Eagle. We've been particularly pleased with the emblem of our flight, depicting the U.S. Eagle, bringing the universal symbol of peace from the Earth, from the planet Earth, to the moon, that symbol being the olive branch. It was our overall crew choice to deposit a replica of this symbol on the moon. Personally, in reflecting the events of the past several days, a verse from the Psalms comes to mind to me. When I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? The responsibility for this flight lies first with, with history and with the giants of science who have preceded this effort. Next to the American people who have, through their will, indicated their desire. Next to four administrations and their congresses for implementing that will and then to the agency and industry team that built our spacecraft. The Saturn, the Columbia, the Eagle, and the little EMU, the spacesuit and backpack that was our small spacecraft out on the lunar surface. We'd like to give a special thanks to all those Americans who built those spacecraft, who did the construction, the design, the test, and put their their heart and all their abilities in, into those crafts. To those people, tonight we give a special thank you. And to all the other people that are listening and watching tonight, God bless you. Good night from Apollo 11. Eleven, this is Pearson. We're getting a zoom view out the window now.
systems on Eagle are looking good. Now you're looking good at two ping zags and missed in all agree. Right down, you have one. Roger. Height now approaching 32,000 feet. down the track. Everything's great. Horizontal velocity approaching 2,500 feet per second. Got the beam uh, up to our right now. Roger. Some 120 miles to go until insertion.
Ritter out there. And there it is, right there. Where there's your pet. And that's impressive looking at it. All three data sources are agreeing quite closely here. The three color plot board on the front of mission control here is almost uh, superimposed as each of the three colors are scribed on the scribing plotter. Eagle Houston, uh, you still looking mighty fine. Uh, still the beat go and both eyes and things. Roger. One minute to go in the burn. 4,482 feet. And 800 to go. 700 to go. Okay, I'll open up the main shuttle. Roger, Eagle Yeah, I 
agree with that, but we agree with okay. that. Houston, I do let him wait for you whenever you're ready to copy. Uh, not right now, Ron. We're going to have it later. Would you please? Uh, Roger, we'll stand by. Uh, 
Columbia, and if any of you are doing a leak check, uh, missed anything after that.